Right, good morning, everybody. Uh, those of you online all around the world and those arriving into a, a wet, uh, gray uh, New York morning here, um, and the room will fill up, I'm sure, in the next few minutes. Um, I'm John Morrison. I'm the CEO of the Institute for Human Rights and Business. Um, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be here. Thank you to our friends at the Ford Foundation for organizing, giving us the space um, as part of their two days of, I would say celebration, but that's probably the wrong word, um, but marking the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, signed, uh, as we all know, in Paris on the 10th of December, 1948. Now, the, the, if you look at the words of Eleanor Roosevelt, particularly the speech she made in 1958 um, about human rights in all the small places, on the factory, on the farm and in the office, the business component, the responsibility of business has always been part of the human rights mix. And I think as we move forward and reflect, the first panel uh, will reflect on the past 75 years and then our second panel this morning will look ahead as best we can to see what does this business responsibility really mean. Um, I will now hand to my colleague, Salil Tripathi, who is our um, IHRB special advisor on global issues, who is also an author and a leading thinker. Um, he will start the morning um, by giving us some remarks and reflections on why today matters. Thank you. Salil. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Where, after all, do human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any map of the world. These are the words of Eleanor Roosevelt, who said this in a speech marking the 10th anniversary of the UDHR, named among those places as the factory, the farm, and the office. She was reaffirming the intent of the UDHR, that it was not merely a contract between the state and the citizen, but applied to and affected everyone all the time, anywhere. The declaration was drafted in the wake of the cataclysmic World War II. Picture the Allied soldiers walking through the ruins of Europe and discovering the ultimate horror of the Holocaust, liberating sick and emaciated survivors in concentration camps. The mass atrocities of that war led to the creation of new institutions in the hope that such a conflict would never happen again. Never again, the world resolved. The distinguished Norwegian diplomat Jan Ilyasson would put it rather well later. There can be no peace without development, no development without peace, and no lasting peace or sustainable development without respect for human rights and the rule of law. Together with the Chinese philosopher Peng Chung Chang, the French Nobel laureate René Cassin, Lebanese philosopher Charles Malik, Indian educationist Hansa Mehta, and other experts, Eleanor Roosevelt and this group of women and men crafted a declaration that has stood the test of time. It brings together civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights, showing how interconnected, interwoven, complementary, universal, and inalienable these rights are. True, the politics of the Cold War created a division between those focused on civil and political rights and others on economic, social, and cultural rights. True, again, governments did as they wished, placing some rights over others. And as the years passed, some criticized the declaration as outdated or imposing Western norms and values or placing rights over duties to community. We should be cautious of speaking of Western norms. As Frank Mugisha, the Ugandan LGBTQI rights activist puts it, homosexuality was always part of Africa. Homophobia was a Western import. Many governments calling for human rights often neglect their own obligation to respect, protect, promote, or fulfill human rights, using power imbalance or cultural relativism as an excuse. While aspects of various faiths and philosophies do align with human rights, some traditions and schools of thought perpetuate discrimination against those who worship differently or not at all, against women, different ethnicities, or those of different sexual orientation, class, caste, abilities, and so on. 
The Declaration's beauty is how it weaves together the nobler animal elements of all traditions and creates a document that treats everyone equally as a universal, common standard of humanity. It lets us reinterpret modern challenges and dilemmas. Electronic surveillance, the UDHR refers to privacy and arbitrary detention. Forced labor or servitude, there are strictures against that. Health and environment, the Declaration anticipates that too. And it does so in ways that allow rights-enabling leadership and all of us to apply the principles to our time. This language has inspired countless leaders. At the conclusion of his Rivonia trial in 1964, before he was taken away for 27 years in prison, Nelson Mandela said, I have cherished the ideals of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal for which I hope to live for and to see realized. But my Lord, if it needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. That determination comes from a desire to fight injustice, something we must. Yes, Eli Wiesel. There may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must be never a time when we fail to protest. Or the brave Honduran, Bertha Kakares. They are afraid of us because we are not afraid of them. And over in Iran, Nargis Mohammadi, this year's Nobel laureate, has said, women will not give up. We are fueled by a will to survive, whether we are inside prison or outside. Long before William Wilberforce in England and Abraham Lincoln in the US removed the shackles of slavery, in 1511, the Dominican friar Bartolome de la Casas was implored, was imploring the conquistadors, tell me by what right or justice do you hold these Indians in such a cruel and horrible servitude? If those words indicate why civil and political rights are crucial, here's Mohandas Gandhi from India, where I was born, speaking of how those of us with power must use it to remove miseries of those who lack access to basic necessities. Weeks before he was assassinated, he said, I will give you a talisman. Whenever you are in doubt or when the self becomes too much with you, apply the following test. Recall the face of the poorest and the weakest man or woman whom you may have seen and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him or her. Will he or she gain anything by it? Then you will find your doubts and yourself will melt away. Factory, farm and office. It is the infrastructure that we are talking about. And it is instructive that when Roosevelt spoke of those rights, she spoke of places where we work, private spaces run by businesses. The declaration itself in affirming that every individual and every organ of society had responsibilities to promote its objectives. It was pointing to the reality that the world of business had a role to play as well. But business meant money and capital and power. Business sought profit. And its pursuit of profit and efficiency, it would inevitably cut corners, seek fewer regulations, sometimes manipulate markets, and exploit workers. Businesses went around the world to trade and ended up colonizing vast territories. In West Africa, as it sought to produce energy, it left a devastated landscape and destroyed environment. In reducing cost of production of a vast range of products, from garments to consumer electronics, it sought out workers in Asia and beyond, driving down standards, wages, and undermining trade unions. Its poor regard for safety standards gave us disastrous outcomes in places like Bhopal in India and Dhaka in Bangladesh. More recently, companies have contributed to or benefited from armed conflict, raising the risk of being complicit in Syria, Sudan, and elsewhere. And yet, there has been an exemplary conduct by businesses and business executives. In Nigeria, I know of cases where during a period of bitter ethnic conflict, one oil company made its helicopters available to fly local people to safety. During the Second World War, Oskar Schindler saved the lives of countless Jews employing them in his factories to prevent them from being sent to death camps. In Rwanda, Paul Ruse Sabigana opened the doors of his hotel to provide refuge to Tutsis during the genocide. In 2019, Carola Racket, the German scientist and ship captain, defied the Italian government and brought refugees stranded at sea to safety at Lampedusa. And Arne Renan did the same, saving more than 400 Afghan refugees in 2001, defying an adamant Australian government. Companies operating in Ireland during the Troubles signed the McBride Principles to make sure that sectarian strife did not infect the workforce. And during apartheid South Africa, many companies signed the Sullivan Principles to ensure equal pay for equal work and equal opportunities for all, regardless of color. 
In more recent years, companies have come together in multi-stakeholder initiatives to act in ways that respect human rights in how their facilities are guarded, where they buy minerals from, how they share revenue with governments, as well as speaking out in public, defending the Black Lives Matter movement here in the US, and speaking out for LGBTQI rights in the US and beyond. We face immense humanitarian crisis. The climate crisis demands a collective shift from our carbon-intensive, heat-generating environment to a cleaner, rights-respecting future based on just transitions. Automation threatens to social stability as jobs become obsolete. Artificial intelligence offers a more fun world, less tedious future, which poses existential challenges. Rising xenophobia produces politicians offering simplistic solutions. Over 60 elections, including in countries as influential as the US, Russia, India, South Africa, and Indonesia loom. And amid 60 global conflicts, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the terrible attack on, attack on Israel in October, and Israel's devastating and disproportionate response in Gaza challenge our world order. With such realities, it's fair to ask, do the words of the UDHR still matter? Do they continue to resonate in such a bleak scenario? Can business play a constructive role in helping to strengthen and renew the international architecture intended to protect the rights we all believe that belong to all the people? We must believe in a better tomorrow. I turn to Gandhi again. When I despair, he said, I remember that all through history, the way of truth and love have always won. There have been tyrants and murderers, and for a time, they can seem invincible. But in the end, they always fail. Think of it. Always. This is not naive optimism on my part or a desire for a fairy tale ending. To conclude, I leave us with the words of Atslav Havel. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. Those words should guide us from tomorrow and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Salil. This was the inspiration and the, the start we needed for today. <clears throat> um, thank you, everyone who is still coming into the room. Thank you for people joining online, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, just to remind people, we're going to have about an hour of discussions, and then there will be time for Q&A. In the room, we have two microphones, so towards the end of the discussion, if you have questions, please feel free to walk up to the mics and ask your questions. And if you're online, we're also going to be taking questions from the online audience, so feel free to ask them. So when Ford invited us to host this event, um, we knew, us being the Institute for Human Rights and Business, we knew that we wanted to focus on the role of one particular actor in protecting and promoting human rights. And this is the role of business. Mm -hmm. We also knew we wanted to reflect on the past 75 years and we wanted to look ahead at the future challenges and, and opportunities that we have ahead of us. And I think it's no coincidence that this first panel, the panel that is looking back at the last 75 years, is very much looking at the labor rights aspect and workers' rights aspect of human rights. As Salil said, Eleanor Roosevelt herself talked about the office, the farm, and the factory as the places close to home and close to all of us where human rights really matter. Um, and the UDHR also includes labor rights as human rights. But way before, decades before the, the UDHR was adopted, the labor rights movement was already making headway. In 1919, post-World War I, the, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, was established very much under the premise that social justice is the only way to achieve peace and lasting peace, especially given the exploitation of workers in industrialized nations or by industrialized nations of that time. Now, we're talking about 1919, but those words still ring true today. And so I think it's very timely that we're reflecting back on the past 75 years, but we're also looking further ahead and focusing very much on the rights of workers and labor rights issues. 
And for those reflections, I couldn't be joined by a better panel. I'm very honored to have you all here. So today I'm joined by Luca ben Lucas Benitez, who is the co-founder of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. And Lucas will be presenting in Spanish, so we also have Marley here who will be interpreting for Lucas. We have Marcella Manubens from Roxbury Global, but Marcella is also former VP of Social Sustainability at Unilever and has worked most of her career very close to business. And we have Jason Judd, who is the Executive Director of the Global Labor Institute of Cornell. Thank you very much for being here. So Lucas, I'll jump straight in and I'll come to you first. So you're part of the labor movement. You re represent workers, farm workers, agricultural workers. Agriculture is a sector that has historically struggled with law enforcement, access to social protection, and a lot of the issues faced by those workers are systemic. Mm -hmm. When you reflect back on the last 75 years or the last 100 years, if we were to talk about the labor rights movement, how much progress has actually been made and what are some of the, the lessons that we haven't learned and that we are yet to learn? Bueno, eh, muchas gracias por la invitación. Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches, donde nos están viendo. So first of all, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, good morning, good afternoon and good night, wherever you are. Eh, exactamente, eh, es un honor estar acá, ¿no? Porque 75 años de derechos humanos y cuando Eleonor Roosevelt estaba encabezando este movimiento hace 75 años después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial, Y cuando ella dice que los derechos humanos se tratan de lo que pasa en los pueblos chicos, en los ranchos, fábricas y en lugares que no aparecen en el mapa. And it's an honor to be here, especially marking that 75th anniversary of when Eleanor Roosevelt was beginning to head this movement and when she spoke about these small places, about the, fa the farms, the factories and the offices. Cuando yo leí esto dije, pues estaba pensando en Imoca, ¿qué pasó? And when I read that, I thought you know, how prescient she must have been thinking of Immokalee. Uh, Immokalee is, uh, estamos en, aquí en los Estados Unidos, en el deep south de los Estados Unidos, como se dice. Immokalee is a small town uh, here in the United States, in the deep south of the United States. Es un pueblo eh, olvidado, tal vez de los Estados Unidos, pero un pueblo que alimenta a los Estados Unidos, especialmente durante la temporada de invierno. It is a small town that is perhaps largely forgotten in the United States, but it is one that feeds the country. Lo formamos trabajadores, hombres y mujeres que hacemos el trabajo agrícola. Uh, it is formed mostly by farm workers, those of us who work in the fields. Pero es el pueblo donde nació el nuevo programa de WSR. But it is also the home and the place where the new model of WSR was born. Un modelo de responsabilidad social corporativa dirigido por nosotros, los hombres y mujeres trabajadores que somos afectados diariamente en el trabajo. So this is that concept of social responsibility directed by workers themselves or worker driven social responsibility, those of us who actually work in the fields and experience those conditions. Lo cual hoy representa básicamente un nuevo paradigma para la protección de derechos humanos en las cadenas de suministro corporativas. And it essentially represents a new paradigm in this conversation, in this broad movement for social responsibility and corporate supply chains. Cuando yo llegué a Imocali, directamente de México, en los años 90, a trabajar en los campos, yo venía preparado para eso, hacer un trabajo duro, hacer un trabajo eh, fuerte, pero no para recibir las violaciones de, de mis derechos humanos en los campos. When I arrived from Mexico in the early 90s to work in the fields, I arrived ready for hard work. I arrived ready to, uh, to go into the fields and to perform that labor, but what I was not prepared for was facing constant violations of my human rights in that process. Ahí me di cuenta que los derechos humanos no eran universales. And I realized that, in fact, uh, uh, human rights were not universally respected. Robo de salarios violencia física y esclavitud moderna, acoso sexual, era la regla. Things like wage theft, forced labor, sexual assault, physical violence, that was the norm. 
Eso fue lo que nos impulsó a, en 1993 empezar a organizarnos como una comunidad de trabajadores y trabajadoras. And that is what drove us 30 years ago in 1993 to begin organizing as farm workers to respond to those abuses. Eh, para defender y reclamar nuestros derechos humanos. To fundamentally respond and defend our human rights. Porque nuestros patrones violaban nuestros derechos humanos sin ninguna conse consecuencia. Because in those days, bosses would violate your human rights without a single consequence. Después de una década de huelgas, marchas, y una huelga de hambre por seis de nuestros compañeros de 30 días, eh, vimos algunos cambios que fueron realmente medidos, se podían medir. And after many years of work stoppages, strikes, even a 30-day hunger strike by six of our members, we were able to see the beginnings of measurable change. Ahí nos dimos cuenta que si realmente queríamos conseguir un cambio, eh, realmente para nosotros y para la industria, teníamos que, que hacer algo diferente. And we realized that if we wanted to see real and lasting change, we needed to be doing things a little differently. Teníamos que crear un poder, un poder que nos pusiera en la mesa, pero que nos mantuviera en la mesa. We needed to create a new form of power and access that power, a kind of power that wouldn't simply bring us to the table, but would keep us at the table. Y lo más importante, que estos cambios y estas eh, nuevas reglas fueran realmente algo sustentable, algo enforzable también. And most importantly, that whatever changes we were able to achieve, whatever protections we had, were not only sustainable, but durable. No tan solo queríamos declarar nuestros derechos humanos, queríamos y nos surgía hacerlos cumplir. We didn't only want to establish our human rights, we wanted to enforce them. Por eso fue que básicamente después de reflexionar en grupo, eh, llegamos a un nuevo análisis de la industria agrícola. And so we began to reflect as a group and we arrived at a new analysis of the agricultural industry. Donde nos dimos cuenta que realmente el poder que nos hacía pobres, que permitía que nos golpearan y que todos esos abusos que les acabo de mencionar pasaran sin ninguna consecuencia. We realized that that, that power, that, uh, that force that allowed us to be beaten, that allowed our wages to be stolen, that put us in poverty. Esos uh, no venían directamente de, de las labores o del campo donde estábamos trabajando. They didn't originate from the fields in which we were working. Sino venían de realmente de las oficinas corporativas, de los grandes compradores que compran el producto que nosotros eh, hacemos. Podemos ser trabajadores agrícolas, podemos ser trabajadores de la industria textil, trabajadores de minas, de donde sea. We realized that they originate, that power originated with the large corporate buyers at the top of the supply chain, whether you're a farm worker or a factory worker or working in, or working in the mines. En nuestro caso, compañías como McDonald's, Burger King, Walmart, exactamente, son las que tenían las manos y tienen las manos metidas en esta industria. And so in our case, as farm workers, we're talking about companies like McDonald's, Burger King, Walmart. That is the hand at work uh, in the market. Porque ellos son los que presionan los ranchos donde nosotros trabajamos a que les ofrezcan un producto barato, a que les ofrezcan un producto, como ellos dicen, de un precio accesible, el cual se refleja en los tratos que damos a nosotros los trabajadores y trabajadoras. Because it's from those buyers that the pressure comes for, for farmers to produce and provide not only a product, you know, that is, that is cheap, but, a, you know, that is called a reasonable price or an accessible price, and that that's really the point of origin for a lot of the abuse that we face. Así que nos organizamos, no tan solo los trabajadores, sino nos organizamos con gente como ustedes, los que nos están viendo, los que están aquí, consumidores. And so we began organizing not only with farm workers, but also with people just like all of you in the room here, and people uh, just like you who are online with consumers. Para demandar no solamente comida, sino comida justa. To start asking not just for food, but for fair food. Para demandar que esas corporaciones firmaran acuerdos vinculantes con nosotros, la Coalición de Trabajadores de Imocali, para ejercer y respetar y enforzar derechos humanos básicos para miles de hombres y mujeres en esta industria. 
so that these companies would sign legally binding agreements directly with us as the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, with the labor organization, in order to establish and enforce and ensure human rights for all of the women and men in their supply chain. O sea, condicionar esa compra en el cumplimiento de los derechos humanos universales en las labores de donde salen esos productos. Essentially, to predicate their purchasing on the enforcement of human rights in their supply chain. Haciendo así, que si ellos no cumplen con estos eh, derechos, respetar estos derechos, simple y sencillamente no pueden estos rancheros, estas granjas, vender su producto a estas grandes corporaciones. In essence, what we were able to establish is that if these farms were, and these growers were not able to ensure and enforce human rights, they were not able to sell their product to these massive corporations. Hoy tenemos a 14 de las más grandes corporaciones del mundo trabajando con nosotros con acuerdos legales vinculantes a respetar y a enforzar derechos humanos en los campos donde salen los tomates y otros productos a sus mercados. And so today we've been able to win and establish 14 such agreements with some of the world's largest corporations and food buyers that again are uh, committing those buyers to working with us in order to ensure that they are using their purchasing power to enforce human rights in their supply chain for tomatoes as well as other products. Asegurando así que nosotros mismos, los hombres y mujeres que trabajamos en los campos, somos los que monitoreamos y enforzamos el cumplimiento de esos derechos. And that's ensuring a system in which we as workers not only hold those agreements, but are the frontline monitors of our own rights, making sure that that is real on the ground. En otras palabras, hoy, Hemos creado con estos acuerdos eh, consecuencias donde antes no había. In other words, we as workers were able to create real consequences where before there existed none. Y hoy día puedo decir lo que estamos haciendo cumplir la responsabilidad social de las corporaciones que antes ellos han dicho que era enorme y que se respetaba y no voy a decir la palabra que me gustaría decir. Pero que solamente era eso, palabras. We've essentially been able to create a system in which these commitments that companies make are in fact enforced. Because in reality, even though for many, many years, many companies have made large and broad declarations about their commitments to human rights, unfortunately, many of those declarations remain just that, words. Esos son los principios básicos del nuevo modelo de WSR, dirigido por nosotros los trabajadores y respaldado por la uh, compra de las corporaciones participantes basado en estos acuerdos legales. Those are some of the principles of this new WSR model, or worker-driven social responsibility, that it is truly directed by workers themselves, and that it is truly enforceable on the ground through legally binding agreements. En los últimos 12 años, se ha comprobado como el único modelo capaz de proteger los derechos humanos en cadenas de suministro corporativas, y la visión para un futuro más justo y más moderno de millones de hombres y mujeres en diferentes industrias. And over the last 12 years that we've been implementing this model, it has proven itself unparalleled in its ability to in fact enforce human rights for workers and has the potential to protect the lives and well-being of millions of workers in many industries. Con esos principios hemos podido eliminar el acoso sexual, la violencia y el trabajo forzado. With these protections, we've been able to essentially eradicate sexual assault, forced labor, and other human rights abuses. Hemos logrado que como hombres y mujeres trabajando en estas industrias, podamos hablar y reportar abusos. Abusos que hoy día, gracias a estos acuerdos, cuando reportas una queja, se resuelve en menos de dos semanas y la puedes reportar sin miedo a represalia. Today, as workers under the Fair Food Program and the WSR model, we are able to actually speak without fear of retaliation. We're able to report abuses uh, without that fear that we're going to, to lose uh, our, our ability to work. El cambio ha sido tanto de dejar atrás una industria llena de vergüenza. And so what we've been able to leave behind is an industry rooted in shame. Una industria llena de abusos para salir hacia un nuevo día. We've been able to, to emerge from an industry rooted in abuse into a new day. Una industria que en Florida hasta el mismo presidente George W. Bush llamó como 
la tierra de cero para, ¿cómo era? El ground zero para esclavitud moderna. From an, in, and this was born in an industry that, um, that President Bush himself said was ground zero for modern day slavery. Para lograr hacer una industria hoy, una industria que se distingue dentro de las demás industrias de la agricultura en los Estados Unidos. Into one of the best working environments in American agriculture. El punto de aquí siempre ha sido y siempre fue la visión de la coalición y de nosotros era de ganar, ganar y ganar. And the vision for this was, had always been part of what we had looked for as the CIW, which was a win-win-win. Donde los trabajadores ganamos, donde las eh, productores ganan y donde las corporaciones ganan y nosotros todos los consumidores también ganamos por consumir productos justos. In which, of course, workers are able to, are, are winning, <laughs> are able to have a good situation. Also, in which farms are, are doing better, corporations are profiting, and consumers are also able to have a just product. Y todo eso lo creamos con una ecuación matemática donde yo mismo me incluyo, creada por unos analfabetas tal vez, porque no tuve la oportunidad de ir a la universidad, pero sabemos de matemáticas, creando C más C igual a C. And we did that through a very simple mathematical equation that perhaps was created, um, you know, and I include myself in this, uh, by a community that is largely illiterate. Many of us didn't have the opportunity to finish school or go to college, but we do know math. And we created the equation of C plus C equals C. Creando conciencia en nosotros, nuestra comunidad, sacando el compromiso de muchos de ustedes para ver el cambio que hoy estamos haciendo y que sigue creciendo a nivel nacional e internacional eh, por este programa de WSR. And so that is consciousness that we are able to create in our community plus the commitment of many people just like you all in order to create the change that we are now seeing, not only in Immokalee, but across the country and across the world through the WSR model. Y como dijera Eleonor Roosevelt hace 75 años, esta nueva esperanza ya comprobada, replica y, replicada y expandida a múltiples industrias en cinco continentes, nació en Immokalee. And again, in celebration of the words spoken by Eleanor Roosevelt all those years ago, This is a model that today is being replicated in states across the United States and also in countries and industries across the world. And it was born in Immokalee. En ese pueblo chiquito, marginalizado y olvidado. In a town that is small, that is marginalized and largely forgotten. Básicamente, eh, nació por la lucha de nosotros mismos, los hombres y mujeres que trabajamos en esta industria, e inspirada, literalmente, por este librito azul. And it was born again of the work of farm workers themselves, of workers taking the lead on that process, and it was largely inspired actually by this small blue book. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Muchas gracias. I have many questions I want to ask you, but I'll turn to Jason now. Jason, you worked with labor rights and supply chains for what, 20 plus years now. Um, a lot of the issues that Lucas talked about are issues that we see also in the sectors that you worked with, apparel, fishing, manufacturing. Looking back, if we think, say, about the 90s or the 2000s, that period is often presented as a period of prosperity, optimism. But we know that that prosperity is due largely because of violations of the rights of workers that happened in Asia, in Latin America, and in other regions where not only businesses, but governments as well, um, benefited from circumstances that thrived on cheap labor, um, where undermining the rights of workers, um, the rights of unions, was a way of doing business, and where actually there was no incentive to promote the rights of workers and to adhere to international labor standards. So when you reflect back, based on your experience, what's your take on how the role of business has evolved, 
Have we come a long way or are we still stuck in the same cycle? Okay. Well, thanks for, thanks for having me here. Um, well, thinking about, thinking about working conditions in, in apparel production, for example, or in, 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 in commercial fishing, um, at a high level, they sound a lot like the story that Lucas was telling. So in the, in the, in the early mid-90s, um, we saw in places like uh, mm. in, in, in Guatemala, in Thailand, and other places where global production was happening for, uh, for major markets like the US and EU, stories about wage theft and forced labor. Um, and I, uh, I began work uh, in, uh, first in New Orleans, organizing garbage workers, and, um, and then in, in Texas, organizing um, hotel workers. And I didn't know. I didn't know what the declaration. I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know that there was such a thing. And after organizing in the U.S. for uh, a number of years, I went to. I went to Cambodia to run the Solidarity Center, and was was introduced to corporate codes of conduct and the and the, the ILO's core labor standards, and uh, was struck by the the gap between what those what those declarations promised, or what they what they what they aspired to, what they held, and what was what was happening on the ground. So uh, workers, workers in the Cambodian apparel industry being uh, cheated out of uh, their, their, their wages or working, working 80 and 90 hours a week instead of, instead of the legal 45 or 50. Um, and I was naive and I was struck by the, 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 the huge and persistent gap between what, what rights said workers ought to have and what, what companies, employers, governments, and their buyers collectively were, uh, were delivering. And I, I began to think about what, uh, what it was that would drive those two closer together, the, the aspirations, the goals, rights of workers, and the, and the, the practices in, in apparel factories or on board fishing vessels or uh, among um, sanitation companies in New Orleans or, or farms in, in Florida. And lit on a, f a few things. Um, this is not this is not, <laughs> this is not novel. I was just I was just naive. It was it was an interruption in the trade relationship, and in Cambodia we we had that. In the in the waning years of the Clinton administration, there was a deal that said access to the U.S. market for Cambodian apparel will be tied to respect for the the, the global labor standards, the ILO's core labor standards. So there was there was incentive for the employers to sort of stay stay the hand and, among other things, allow workers to organize. So a, a, a labor movement uh, was growing was growing and and fast um, in those uh, in those years. Uh, so that was one, interruption to the trade relationship, uh, or a threat to the trade relationship, and the story that Lucas tells is also uh, uh, an example of a threat to, a threat to the, the, the trade relationship. Something that interrupts business helps to drive together these, these, two, these, two, these two dynamics, or these two, uh, these two phenomena, the rights and the, and the practices. Um, a second is tragedy. I was, I was again in Cambodia 10 years later at the ILO uh, when the, when the, uh, the factories in the Rana Plaza building collapsed and killed uh, 12, 1,200 or, or more workers. So tragedy is a second one that pushes together these two, these two phenomena. Um, and the third is uh, a, a tight labor market. I hate to say it, but a lot of the progress that we, where we see progress over the last, over the last say, 30 years in, in global production, where, let's say, a, a US apparel buyer or a European food buyer uh, is 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 seeing or are contributing to changes on the ground. Uh, it's often it's often uh, not a function of of a well built program, though that that sometimes matters. It's often uh, a tight labor market. And here's an example from well from from Vietnam from a paper that we've just at, at Cornell that we've just published on climate breakdown and apparel production. Uh, factories often are hot hot places made hotter by all the, all the people and the material and the machinery. And uh, we see little being done about it in, in Cambodia, for example, or in Bangladesh or in Pakistan. Those were three countries that we studied for these reports. Uh, in the fourth, Vietnam, we see, uh, we see factories making investments in, in cooling technologies to bring down the temperatures of the buildings, to bring down, to cool the, to cool the people. 
And that's driven not by a, a program that, that Gap or H&M or Nike or Adidas or another has introduced at the factory level, but by a labor market that's tightening and by uh, Vietnam's, Vietnam's rapid ascent into the, into the, the ranks of middle-income countries. And in those factories, the employers are digging out wells to cool, the, to cool the, the, the ground space, and they're introducing active and passive cooling technology. So um, it's hard to disaggregate what's driving, what's driving the change, but I would, I'd argue that those three, the interruption to the, the trade or the business relationship uh, tragedy and, uh, and a tight labor market are, are major contributors. In the work that we, in, in some of the work that we've done at, at Cornell, we look at, uh, we look at the small places. We look at data from audit firms showing uh, the gap, it's graphs uh, or quantifies the gap between what, what a code of conduct says and what the, what the audit reveals. And you would expect over time to see this, this, this audit uh, and remediation regime leading to, in the aggregate, changes in working conditions, improvements in wages, uh, a decline in working hours, fewer accidents, et cetera. And the analysis that we did of 40,000 small places, these were from audits performed in apparel factories, toy factories, farms over the last, over the last uh, 10 years, we see, we, see, we see no change in the aggregate. We see it going up a little, we see it going down a little, but we see that private regulation by itself does not drive, uh, does not drive large scale change. And that what's missing, and maybe, maybe, this, is, maybe this is for later or maybe this is for, for, for panel two, uh, it's, the, it's the threat of the interruption to the trade relationship now represented by the, the for example, the USMCA, the, the NAFTA II agreement. Um, or, the, uh, or the changes in the Tariff Act here in the United States that, that uh, threaten to withhold shipments uh, of goods made with or believed to be made with forced labor and, uh, and the, the human rights due diligence legislation that's coming, that's coming apace in Europe. So it's the combination of all these things, and maybe we can, maybe we can argue about you know, what, what, what's contributing what, but that's, that's what I've seen in the last 25 years. Thanks, Jason. That's very helpful. And Marcella, I also wanted to ask you about the, the driving factors. So you worked for most of your career with, with large corporations, and you, you saw firsthand the evolution of the business and human rights agenda, and you were part of that change in many ways. Um, you also took part in business initiatives that were quite ambitious, you know, trying to drive improvements with regards to living wage, um, gender equality, women's economic empowerment. Jason talked a little bit about the driving factors, but from your perspective, from the corporate perspective, if you will, what are some of those factors driving change in the business and human rights ecosystem and driving real change on the ground? Where are we now? Have we made progress? Okay, well, uh, thank you, Julia. A, t a tall task and, and question. I want to thank the, the Ford Foundation for hosting us and for the incredible institute for always, you know, driving these events and asking us tough questions. And the uh, unstoppable John Morrison, who has been a critical friend uh, forever. And there are many critical friends here uh, as well, which I will mention later on. Um, so, you know, as I was preparing uh, for today and reading the background and, uh, of the event, um, it reminded me the words of Eleanor Roosevelt that I often reflected that when we talk about human rights, everybody talks in third person. I don't know if you notice. It's always about someone else. It's about the child, maybe in Africa, or the woman in Asia. But it's never about us. It starts with someone else. And I will argue that what our movement is, whether you are in private sector, you know, NGOs, or unions, or labor movement, is about each and every one of us. It starts with me. And that has been probably the driving force of the initiative that I have taken. And I have seen, you know, many adding up where it's Lucas or Jason or David or 
David Schilling, David Jury Colley back there. I mean, colleagues who I could rely on, whether we have a different perspective, always to try to advance issues together. So I started, I mean, uh, Julia referred to, I started, I, my background was business. I study, I come from Argentina. One would say that I have a crash course on human rights, growing up as a child in dictatorship and everything that happened. And, um, and the CEO of a fashion company, who I knew well, uh, Phillips Van Heusen at the time, Bruce Glatz, he says, you know, there are certain issues going on in Central America, and they are telling me all the things I want to go and see. Would you come with me? This was 1991. I was a rookie. And, uh, and he said to me, um, I want you to, to tell me honestly what you see. So while they, we were having all these meetings, they were having meetings, I went and I looked, and, and it was a difficult truth, not only for that company, but for everybody. Because the advancement of a global economy, uh, and, and I think that you referred to, and Salil referred to, uh, be careful to looking into other contexts with, the, with your eyes and your perspective. You talk about Western view. Um, and I think that that was the beginning and the eye-opening for me. Upon return, of course, I wrote a report and uh, probably what Jason was referring to, all those codes, I may have been guilty as charged as we started one of the first global human rights uh, codes, and it was called a shared commitment. And this was 1991, 92, I mean, Levi Strauss will will we'll argue that maybe they were the first. So we, we continue having that thing going on. Um, but truly what he intended to do is to take the blue book and to put that blue book into what should it be, the wiring of a corporation. And then, as Lucas says, and, 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 um, and Jason referred to, a code of conduct was not good enough. I mean, what good is to have that framework without the action? So as I, as I reflect in this evolution, not the last 75 years, I wasn't here for the last 75 years, but for what it was my participation, I saw since the 90s to now four more distinctive periods. One was the first period. It was this area of exposés, blame and shame. Uh, denial, you know, polar positions between labor groups and unions and corporations. Corporations were evil, you know, maybe the other organizations have the ultimate truth. And this dynamic prompted certainly action, but didn't resolve the issues, as both of my uh, colleagues, you know, highlighted. Then came the period of auditing and certification, the proof is in the pudding, show me. Let me audit the hell out of all this process. And I don't want to um, criticize that process because I think it, has, it was instrumental to bring parties together to uh, realize that, a, you know, assisted by technology, increasing technology, there was no way to hide. In a global economy, we start realizing the realities of all these places. I mean, that the working conditions were not what we were told. And this idea that, no, my supplier is telling me and is, is complying was not really true. There was a lot of issues that were hidden. And that process was exhausting and exhaustive because I often say garbage in and garbage out. And by that I refer, if the conditions are not good, you can audit all that you want, but you're not gonna improve it because you're not building knowledge. You're not addressing, you're not including the individuals which are at the forefront of what the issues are. And then came a period, the third period of more transparency, of dialogue, collaboration, these uh, collective action was the beginning. The private-public uh, partnerships. I mean, I'm looking at Georg, you know, 
UN Global Compact. I mean, the work started with John and you. I mean, how it was advanced, bringing, trying to bring people together and understanding that it was only in that dialogue that we could advance. You know, there is that issue of if you want to go fast, go along. If you want to go far, go together. Um, and the fourth phase, which I, I wish I could say we are right now, and we are to certain degrees. I'm much more Poliana than my, my other panelists. I'm, more, I'm both hopeful and optimistic, Salil. I know it's not the same, but I'm both. And uh, it's this idea that we are moving from doing no harm to doing, uh, to doing good, to really advancing you know, the issues. Um, I often say, I do not wake up in the morning to say, I'm doing less harm today. I would like to think about that I'm doing, I'm driving the positive, you know, actions. So I, you know, Julia, you're going to, uh, I don't know if you're going to like or this like that, but I came to, I couldn't stop putting down how many things I think it has been improved. One of the first, so I came out with 10 more or less, 11, 12, and continue going. One is transparency. I think that uh, this idea that you're going to get to know. I mean, if something is not working, you will know. We will all know, maybe not today, but we will uh, uh, learn about the facts. I mean, you were referring to Jason. I mean, this idea that there is no way to hide, I used it in the 90s. I mean, it's, it's more than a reality today. Legal frameworks, I think that the, the, the increasing you know, agreement on the issues, and even the EU coming with the, the legal framework next year is a testament to that. And I give tremendous thanks to the work that it's difficult to, to talk about, you know, voluntary frameworks like the UNGPs uh, without naming John Ruggie, right? I mean, the work and the, the John did was transformational for all of us. I mean, to, uh, and what I contribute to that, I mean, he, how many years, Georg, did he invest in going around the world and trying to bring that dialogue and that understanding? We should all learn of that, because that is, I remember I was challenged by someone one time and says, why are we talking about human rights? I mean, it was actually very, uh, at a very high level. Why are we talking about this human rights? I left the meeting, pick up the phone, and I said, John, and John said to me, Marcela, remember, all the countries were, including China, was, you know, signed on the UNGPs. And he says to me, you know, we just came to terms with that. So that was the foundation, was the tool that companies have, someone like me, to say, well, even if it's voluntary, look into these elements, how fundamental they are. Uh, awareness and education. I mean, I cannot underestimate this. It's not about a program, it's about all of us. If you, in business, you don't develop that awareness and education, I mean, uh, you know, Lucas was talking about the voices of workers. I mean, you need to open that space. You need to build that capacity so everybody can, at the point of decision making, they can draw from that knowledge and make the best decision possible. And that, for me, has been transformation, and I believe it's happening quite in, in corporations. Uh, I talk about uh, collective action and partnerships. I mean, uh, corporate governance. I, I think that even the less committed companies, everything has been transformed. When you look into the, the policies and the wiring of organizations, increasingly mandatory, that they need to look into those policies and people working within the corporation need to abide and that there is true accountability. One of the most important elements that comes with transparency is accountability and mechanisms to bring that. Um, driving business integrity uh, has been for me, one, you can see it, you, it's impossible, it was impossible back then and uh, nowadays not to open uh, the news or the, the iPad now and read about issues of integrity, right? 
Uh, the community of action that I refer all of us, working uh, with labor and others, the remedy due process, and you can see that I continue addressing this, right? Um, and I just want to, uh, to address the, the one for me, one of the most transformational elements is embedding human rights in everything that a corporation does in every quarter, whether it's done properly or imperfectly by business. It is, it is not about having a side program, it's about putting it. Human rights is the foundation of good business, period. And we need to, you know, recognize that. And I want to, something that the Institute worked very hard uh, for is the human rights defenders, right? I mean, recognizing the role and working with business too to protect that space and working together to really advance. And I can continue, but I know that you, you're going to sort of sp uh, sp uh, stop me. The, the voices of workers that was so well illustrated by Lucas, if for me one of the most important accomplishments during the last uh, years. That's perfect segue, thank you Marcella. Because my next question, and we do have time for questions, so if you have questions here in the audience, make your way to the microphones, and if you're online, do ask your questions. But Lucas, one question for you. You are an organizer. An organizer is a leader. Right? You represent workers, but you also bring workers along with you on a journey. A journey that doesn't always lead to the outcome that everyone expects. There is disappointment. You have to manage expectations. There is compromise. And I think even though Marcella highlighted the progress that has been made, I think businesses can still learn a lot from the labor movement and from organizers, organizers like yourself about what it takes to actually engage in meaningful dialogue with workers and communities. So what can we learn in your view from your experience and what it takes to have meaningful dialogue? Uh, primero, <coughs> yo no soy organizador, ni mi vida la tengo organizada. <laughs> <laughs> Well, first and foremost, I am not an organizer because my life is very disorganized. Uh, somos animadores, eh, animadores en, en nuestra comunidad. Eh, yo no eh, tenía ninguna experiencia. Yo llegué a 17 años en Imacali, eh, un chamaco, pero viendo la, la, el aprieto, las violaciones que estaban pasando de nuestros derechos, o sea, Empezamos, empecé a animar, a, a, junto con otros compañeros, a animarnos a hacer algo. O sea, en la coalición no habemos organizadores, habemos animadores y animadoras. So, um, first, one of the, the ways that we, I am, I am an animator, not an organizer. So this is a, a concept that, um, you know, when I, that we use a lot in our office and in our community. When I arrived in Mockley, I was 17 years old, basically a child, uh, and what ultimately, and organically drove me was experiencing and seeing the pressure and the abuse that was happening um, with people around me. And so both within myself and, and to others, I started animating others to join in having this conversation based in our own experiences. And that's really the framework that we use in Immokalee when we talk about uh, our community. E ¿Cómo llegamos a donde estamos hoy día? Tampoco fue un brinco, como lo dije en, en hace un momento. Nos llevó 10 años de, de lucha de base en nuestro pueblo, gritando dentro de nuestro pueblo eh, lo que estaba pasando. Eh, el trabajo de la coalición de trabajadores de Mocali, como yo siempre lo digo, ha sido un trabajo que ha crecido orgánicamente. And the other important thing to, to note around this process is that what we've been able to achieve in our community uh, was not in one single leap. It took 10 initial years of simply working within our community, um, of coming together and having that conversation and fighting and <laughs> protesting. Y el llegar donde estamos hoy día fue con una visión exactamente de, de querer exactamente tener con nosotros a los que realmente tienen el poder, el descubrir que este, el poder estaba realmente arriba y que tenía que ser el cambio de arriba hacia abajo. Entonces, el traer ese poder de arriba hasta lo más 
uh, abajo. Eh, no fue algo que lo estudiamos en nada, lo descubrimos con esos 10 años de lucha. And the other thing that was critical for that process was always being driven by a collective vision that we, uh, that we came to ourselves. So really identifying over the course of those years and seeing that not only did we need to be, um, you know, coming together as a community, but we needed to bring power into our community. And we need, so first we needed to identify where that power was coming from, which was again at the top of the supply chain. And so it was really, uh, it took many years, of course, of, um, of struggle, uh, but also that collective analysis that we came to, not because we had studied somewhere or heard about it somewhere, but by analyzing and, and experiencing um, what, we, uh, what we were seeing in the fields. Y el traer a esas corporaciones, básicamente, eh, no ha sido fácil, pero hoy día hay muchas de ellas, hay muchos ranchos también que están viendo que este programa es algo que, como lo dije también hace rato, es una situación y eso está creado para ganar, ganar y ganar, donde todos los involucrados ganamos. No es algo nada más en beneficio de nosotros los trabajadores, es en beneficio de todos. And the other thing that we've been able to see, again, as, as workers, is being able to you know, it was not easy to, to, win these, to win that power, to win those legally binding agreements, but we always were also driven by a vision um, of everyone benefiting. Um, and and that we, now we've seen not only that we've benefited, but also that the corporations have. Entonces, yo creo que eh, eso ha sido como tal vez la, la herramienta más, eh, o la llave que nos ha abierto como ese diálogo con, con corporaciones, con eh, eh, ranchos, eh, que este, y lo más interesante del programa de WSR es que es un programa que sí nació en la industria agrícola, pero que se puede adaptar, puede trabajar inclusive, eh, lo estamos haciendo ahorita con, eh, en Chile, donde vamos a lanzar tal vez un piloto en la industria del salmón, donde hay sindicatos, pero el, el programa no viene a eliminar sindicatos, sino viene a fortalecer el trabajo de los sindicatos, a, 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 enforza, a reforzar el trabajo de los sindicatos y, y, y trabajar juntos. No elimina nada, sino refuerza lo que ya hay. So in addition to that kind of bigger vision, you know, and kind of seeing outside of our own community to, uh, to build this model, we were able to uh, build a, a model that was truly accessible and replicable. So the most interesting thing about the WSR model is that not only, uh, yes, it was born in agriculture in a very challenging um, space, but it is uh, replicable. And we're seeing, for example, um, that we're uh, exploring a new pilot program um, in Chile uh, in the salmon industry, in which there is actually quite high union density. Uh, and so we've seen that this program has also can fit into a broader labor movement and broad in other worker communities because it isn't there to eliminate or replace, for example, union organizing, but rather to bring enforcement to the table and to reinforce uh, the work that workers are already doing. And I think when we talk about dialogue, uh, collective action, it's impossible not to mention the role of multilateral institutions. And I think a big question that is very current is the role of the UN and other multi multilateral institutions. Many will claim that there is a breakdown in multilateralism. But I wanted to come to you, Jason. I think you worked at the ILO. You achieved, with one specific program in Thailand, looking at fisheries and the seafood sector in Thailand, you achieved remarkable things in a very challenging context. A context where not only you had to bring workers, business and government into the table because that's the mandate of the ILO, but also a non-democratic context where, because we're talking about Thailand, a context of a machinery that is highly bureaucratic, um, and yet you achieved a lot. So what have you learned and what would you say to those that claim that the system is broken? It's on the record. Gosh. Well, I would say, uh, I would say that, it, so the, 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 the project that, that uh, Julie's talking about is, uh, was an ILO effort to win ratification of the Work and Fishing Convention in Thailand. Um, 
in the, in the aftermath of a series of stories in the, in the AP, you may remember them, 2015, 2016, stories about forced labor in the Thai fishing industry, uh, in the AP and the Guardian and uh, New York Times. And uh, we, all of us, were able to get, uh, were able to convince the, the Thai government that it was in its interest to ratify 188. Um, and I think in part because, uh, because several of those elements that I mentioned earlier were, were present. There was, there was tragedy. The stories of these fishers are mind-bending. Um, the, the second was trade. The European Union said, we will, we will prevent Thai seafood exports coming to the, to the EU unless you fix this problem. So there was the threat of real of meaningful trade action. Um, and the third was a tight labor market. It was increasingly difficult to find migrant fishers, mostly Cambodians and, uh, and, and Shan and Burmese and others, to get on board these vessels. And uh, the labor market was much tighter in, in 2018 than it had been in, say, 2014 or 2015. So all that, all that, all that contributed. Um, it was helpful that the ILO had articulated in this, in this instrument, in this convention, 188, uh, what what decent work in fishing looks like. So uh, among all the ILO instruments, this is this is a pretty technical and prescriptive one. It's not it's not hopelessly vague um, and difficult to, to 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 act out at the national level. Um, so I think the combination of of all that, I would. I mean the story's not the story's not over. That industry is is arguably still uh, a mess. I'm on my way to Lima to see what what uh, what commercial fishing, Chinese vessels off the coast of, or just across the international water line is, is doing to fishing in Peru and, um, and Ecuador, where none of those elements are present, pressure, trade pressure, uh, et cetera. Um, so I would, so is the, ILO, is the, uni, is the multilateral system uh, working? I, I guess if you, if you measured success there by uh, the, the Thai government's commitment to uh, that uh, to, to that standard. So yes, check the box that says they ratified 188. Um, have, have conditions on board those vessels changed in important ways for those fishers? Uh, yes, yes for some. So it's, it's, it's better than nothing, but we're a long way from what 188 and the, and the declaration, for example, say workers, um, workers deserve. What's, what's missing there, what's due there, is the right to organize and the right to bargain and the institutionalization of, of, of these, these rights in an agreement between, uh, between fishers and their employers and, uh, and, and the buyers, all overseen by a legal framework that makes it possible for migrant workers to, to organize and bargain. That's, that's still missing, and without it, I think you won't get, you, I won't call it a success. Thank you, Jason. I would have more questions, but we have someone waiting very patiently to ask a question. If you could please say your name and your organization and then ask your question. And Salil, do we have questions from the online audience as well? So if you, yeah, so yes, please. Hi, um, well, thank you all. Uh, my name is Eugenie de Patspelti. I'm the executive director of uh, the Association for the Rights of Household and Farm Workers. We're based in Montreal, Canada, but we do some work in the European Union, the UK, and, and the United States. Um, I have one small question for Lucas and one question for Marcela and Jason. So it's um, so one of the things we're, we're preparing in the United States is a, it's a constitutional class action to um, challenge the state authority to bind workers in the H2B, H2A programs, so literally under the 13th Amendment, right now to be held in servitude, we're going to challenge, you know, closed work permits. And, uh, well, of course, well, you know what is class action, it's this big, this is huge. Uh, constitu any constitutional action is actually something that is a very big uh, endeavor. We already launched a constitutional class action in Canada against the federal regulation, immigration regulation, but specifically against the federal government. Uh, and we're preparing the same in the UK and with Amnesty International and 
And, but in the US, of course, there's a beautiful 13th Amendment. It's clear, it's there, right, not to be held in servitude. But still, we do have like hundreds of thousands of farm workers that are buying property of specific employers and farms. So, so my question quickly is, um, and by the way, we're in a fundraising campaign, so if anybody has money, we're, we're interested. Um, I just want to say, so fair food, amazing. Uh, we love stories of good apples and how that can inspire the whole movement. Um, fair food, does that necessarily exclude a farm where there are H2A a workers and other agri-food? And also my question for Jason and Marcela is, um, you know, this all, we know that there's some bad apples, you know, bad employers, but um, companies, corporations, and practices. But personally, I've been, I've been, you know, studying human rights for decades. I've been just tired of hearing that, you know, specific companies are wholly responsible. So, so I would like sometimes, you know, the attention to be turned to the state and how state actually really help, uh, you know, creating um, workers that are, um, um, you know, uh, just, uh, uh, well, actually, the, the UN Rapporteur of Contemporary Reform of Slavery, like two weeks ago, came to Canada and said, literally, closed work permit, your whole foreign worker programs, Canada, these are breeding grounds for slavery. You know, it was a bomb. Amazing. Thanks to the UN Rapporteur. So sometimes, you know, there are some very useful stuff that, that is happening. Uh, but I'm just saying that. Let's also, you know, look at the states and what they're doing. And I think constitutional action, honestly, you know, we're talking about food, f the whole food workers. Well, slavery was there for, for centuries. And honestly, you still have unfree labor regime in the states, like feeding you. So the question is, uh, yes, we can talk about, you know, stuff around the edges of the problem, but also let's look at... And, and I don't think it's going to come very easily, so I, I would add maybe a fourth thing that is, yeah, constitutional action, you know, going against the state that, that create breeding grounds for human rights violations. Thank you. Since this is two questions in one, let's address this one, and then Salil will come to you, and we'll take the three questions from the online audience together, yeah? So, Lucas, do you want to go first? Okay. Uh El programa por comida justa protege a los trabajadores H2A que vienen a Florida y a donde quiera que esté el programa implementándose. So the Fair Food Program absolutely is there to protect the rights of H2 workers on the farms where we operate. Y una cosa que pasa mucho aquí en los Estados Unidos es de que muchas veces esos trabajadores que son reclutados en México o en cualquier país llegan con una deuda la mayor parte del tiempo a, a, al, al trabajo no les pagan su transporte, les están cobrando renta, que no es legal. Bajo el Acuerdo por Comida Justa, hemos logrado eliminar el, la cuota de reclutamiento, trabajando directamente con el Departamento de, eh, se, eh, del Trabajo, se puede decir, de México, especialmente, para limpiar ese canal y asegurar que los trabajadores, cuando llegan a Florida, a Tennessee o a cualquier parte donde está el programa, hay dos semanas Después, las compañías tienen que avisarnos cuando llegan los trabajadores y tenemos dos semanas para llegar con ellos y darles el entrenamiento que hacemos de trabajar o trabajador y qué son sus derechos bajo los acuerdos por comida justa y asegurar que están libres de, de, esa, de esa deuda. And so in addition to the issues that farm workers face by not being able to migrate between farms when they arrive, one of the largest problems H2A workers face is begins in their country of origin. So often when they arrive, uh, they arrive with an enormous amount of debt. Uh, they've been charged by a recruiter, uh, and then as they're being brought over, uh, the, you know, um, unscrupulous employers will not comply with the legal requirements to pay for their transportation. They might charge them rent, all of which are illegal, of course. Uh, and so one of the things that we uh, were able to respond through using the framework of the Fair Food Program is creating a clean channel and being able to eliminate a lot of those recruitment fees by, by establishing a channel specifically with the SNE in Mexico, um, which is essentially the Labor Department in Mexico, so that workers, when they come through onto a Fair Food Program farm, we're going actually to the point of origin where a lot of the intimidation happens uh, and are able to bring people into um, a situation in which they um, don't have that debt and, that, and those threats hanging over their heads. 
uh, and then I would just add one small thing that if the given uh, that the H2A program is largely ubiquitous within the United States, the, you know, we certainly uh, could not exclude farms that use H2A from something like the Fair Food Program and doing so I think would be um, given the amount of forced labor cases coming out of farms uh, with H2A programs, given that our program is a preventative program and a rights-based program, um, in the meantime, while the H2A program exists, it's critical that we're there. Uh, Marcella, Jason, and then I think David has a question as well, and, and Salil, so. So, thank you for asking that question. Um, two examples to the point that you were addressing on pressing the government and the states. Um, while I was at Unilever and was in UK, I had the privilege to interact with different organizations. And you may remember the Modern Slavery Act, which was passed in UK. We lend our voice, I lend my voice also to promote that. Um, and there was a point on the implementation. It was very well articulated for companies, but the question is, what happened in public procurement? That is your point. So together, I mean, my CEO supported me on this, uh, Paul Pullman supported me on this, and we asked the government and the Home Office to look into the public procurement because they did not have the elements that they were asking companies to do it. And as a result of that work, there was a statement that Theresa May issue, and the, I think it was the, what is it, John? I mean, you are the UK, I'm an American, Argentinian, the Five Eyes, um, that issue a whole action plan where they were looking into public procurement. But here was interesting, in the meetings that we have at the Home Office, they say, well, how do we do this? And I said, I can bring my procurement colleagues here. So explain how to do a code of conduct, how to look into the issues, what are the requirements, how you can embed this. And it was quite, I, I credit the government for having taken that in a short period of time. And the other example is together with John. I mean, as part of the Consumer Good Forum, Unilever was part of that. We wanted to promote that social ambition. And the one issue that all the companies agreed to was the promotion or the prevention of modern day slavery and forced labor. One of the things I think I, I was tapped or encouraged to do that because Argentina was hosting the G20. So working together with, with John and other colleagues, we really pressed the G20 to put a statement that will impact the governments who were members of that to really press for a more uh, preemptive and proactive action on the prevention of modern day slavery. Now, there are frameworks and they acknowledge and they put a wonderful statement, but your comment was about action. And your comment is about are they really showing the action, or do we really need a class action uh, you know, lawsuit against state and others to really see it implemented? And, and that will go to your prior question to Lucas. There is no other way but uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue and engagement. We may not agree, but my plea is to find the common points what unite us as much and not to focus on what divide us. So thank you for asking the question and give me the chance to share this. Jason, do you want to come in quickly on the Just role real quick, of I, I'm, I'm out of my depth on the legal issues. But um, there, there, are, there are court actions now coming uh, in Germany under the Supply Chain Act. Those will be worth watching. Mm -hmm. um, another just filed in France. Um, so I, to Lucas's point that he made at the top, um, when the consequences for behavior corporate behavior changes, then you can, you can get large scale, you can get um, large scale change. One of the other changes I think we, we see now is that, is that these questions are moving from, you know, from sub-basement two where the sustainability team lives. Ah, that's not fair, but they're often, you know, at the, at the margins, they're not at the business end of the business. And uh, these questions of legal liability move these, move these issues for the first time really uh, over to the, the general counsel's desk and to the, the COO's office. And that, I think, will produce the sort of change that, um, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for. But can, can, I, can I 
challenge you so you answer more. Her comment was about states. I mean, because and in the example of public procurement, the, the UK buys much more than Unilever will ever buy because they have operations all over the world. They hire construction workers, they hire local uh, suppliers, et cetera. To, so to her point, to your point, uh, what is your point of view? I mean, because is, is the network and is the role of the state, in many cases the state does not, you know, does not really set the, the rules that they set for corporations for their own operations. So what is your take? Well, with the caveat that I'm a little, a little out of my depth, uh, I know that, I know that the, the, the Biden administration in what they announced a couple of weeks ago included uh, public procurement there, that they're going to, through executive action, do what they can to advance these advance, advance um, worker rights. I think we're, what we're interested in at, at Cornell, in our little outfit, is in seeing how the playing field can be leveled so that it doesn't fall to company X or government Y to act as it might in the market but to change the, uh, change, the, change the ground rules so that, as Lucas said, the consequences for the corporate behavior that we, we want to end are, are clear, that you're, you're taxing the behavior that you want to, you want to discourage. I, we're almost at time, but can I take, Salil, <coughs> the questions from the online audience and yours, David, as one, and then I'll come well, to the Yes, yeah, you okay. first, Salil, and then David. Yeah, so there are Actually, there's one more has come in. So I think what we'll do is we'll take the other one later in the next panel because there are a couple more like that. One is uh, inspirational, one is aspirational, and one is practical. So just thought I'll let you know. There's a question from Aditi Thorat. Is it time to start over with an approach to promote well-being that is empirical rather than ideological? Can human rights advocates learn from the experience of development economies? And she mentions the work of Esther Duflo, the Nobel laureate, uh, about improving the lives of the people. And about this is about moving out of silos. Another question is from Helen Russell, who thanks the panel. But then she, her question is that, I wonder if the panel could speak how closely the discussion on potential human rights impacts and worker rights relate to the climate discussion, since COP is, uh, just, is still going on. Um, and uh, is it possible to assign the responsibility and liability on environmental social I issues, and is it helpful? And another one that just came in is from Karen Kachadurian, I'm sorry if I mispronounced it, um, whose question is related to Marcella specifically, that global companies are increasingly keen to understand how to approach social audits. The heightened interest is due in partly because of more legislative action, such as the HRDD negotiations going on in Europe. But sustainability leaders are seeking guidance on how to start and where to begin, and where should they do that? I mean, that's the third one. Uh, there are a couple more, but I think I'll try to weave them in the next round. Thanks, Leo. David, and your question? Uh, thank you so much. This has been a great uh, panel. This is David Schilling from the Interface Center on Corporate Responsibility, and I also want to mention the Investor Alliance for Human Rights that is a part of ICCR that's really been moving the needle. I have so much to say, and I have to do it simply. Um, one is, how do we maintain uh, this deep commitment, you know, uh, when you're talking about the CIW, that it, part of it is a, a structure that really works, but it's also individuals like yourself and like uh, Gerardo and a whole range of uh, workers. How do we maintain that uh, sense of uh, purpose integrity as the movement goes uh, farther beyond Immokalee? And it has, because it's been uh, you know, in many other initiatives, uh, Milk with Dignity, the, the Accord on Fire and Building Safety comes out of that. Uh, that. But I wonder, uh, in my own life, it, it, it's, it starts with a kind of proximity. I think of uh, being in, in Bangkok, oh my gosh, this was in 2018, met a worker who had come from Myanmar to Bangkok, worked in a couple of places, sold onto a ship, 16 years later, he was still on that ship, never paid. The, the ships would come into the port, and the fish would be offloaded, but not the workers. There was security, and they were kept. And, and he, even when he came off finally uh, and got to, uh, got to land, he was willing to stay another year in Bangkok because he wanted to make sure the ship owner at the, you know, at the criminal court would be 
uh, would he would give testimony. So to me, it's like it's a combination of our own commitment with structure and s systems. And I, I would love, we're not going to be able to do it now, but uh, if the, you know, the three of you on the panel would uh, say a wee bit, or if you got together for the rest of the afternoon, what, what kind of plan? And to me, it, it's got to be the worker driven as the base. Uh, but where do you see this whole movement uh, going, and how is it going to be sustained, even in a context where human rights are being destroyed as we speak in so many countries, including the United States? And we're just facing all the e anti ESG, which distracts us. How do we keep focus? How do we work together? How do we? Uh, in the next, you know, two, three, five years, build out this kind of worker-driven social responsibility. It seems to me is got to be a, a part of the framework. Thanks, David. Uh, there's a very practical question which Lucas may be able to address, and I'll make it very quick. From Hussein Lutambi, that there are times when there are special training programs given to temporary employees for which sometimes they have to pay and contribute and they don't receive certificates until that is done at the end. So how do we move away from this whole treatment of casual labor by some of the employers? Thanks, Alil. So I'll come to each of you for reflections in whatever order you want to take the questions two minutes each if you can, just so we can wrap up. And just to say in the second panel, we will talk about climate and just transitions. So there will be a lot more about that. So for those of you joining online, come back for the second panel because we will address that in a lot more depth. So Jason, why don't you go first? Um, <laughs> well, on the, on the climate question, uh, we can quantify. We, uh, there's this there's this nexus of climate and labor, and it's it's heat. It's in, it's it's extreme heat, and it's uh, it's intense flooding. We see it in we see it in uh, agricultural work. We see it in in manufacturing. And you so you can you can measure how how extreme heat and intense flooding are doing damage to worker health and cutting into productivity, which means earnings, etc. So I'm not. I, 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 I'm a little suspicious of win-win-win solutions, but in this case, uh, dealing now, adaptive investments that reduce heat will, uh, will pay dividends in terms of worker health, worker earnings, in terms of employer earnings, uh, et cetera. So um, th there is, there's, there's lots of work to be done there at the nexus of, of climate breakdown and, uh, and human rights or worker rights. Um, what was my other idea? Just eating up the seconds here. Oh, if Christy Hoffman was here, Christy's the head of the 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 the, the, the head of uh, Uni or Uni, the Global Union for uh, Service Workers. She would say that uh, the most important thing is, uh, in answer to David's question, um, we need we need. Uh, framework agreements that say here are the enabling rights and here are the ways in which the employers together, global employers with global unions, will, uh, uh, will guarantee them and we need, we need agitation and organizing uh, on the ground. Without that, without that combination, it's hard to, to bring change on a, on a large scale. Thanks, Jason. Marcella. Um, I mean, a few reflections. I'm not totally answering those questions or those, but I think that we are as we stand today, we are very long in goals and short in deliveries. Um, I think that how we did it in the past is not how we are going to do it in the future. And if we are to achieve what we said we want to achieve, we need to create enabling environments. We need to bring people together. We need to build trust. Because everything that Lucas talked about only happened because there was the beginning of a dialogue and there was trust. For sure, there were, an, uh, there were environments and legal requirements, but there was, it could have been a very defensive process, it was, but they came to that moving point. And it reminds me that years back, we are talking about early 2000s in a factory in China, they have voted on something and the voting process was totally fixed. So working with the Fair Labor Association at the time of Red, I said, what do we do? Do we just let go? We go to vote again? And, and we agree. We said, no, let us go to the factory with management and workers and let us engage in discussion of what it matters. So we did that and thought of for China. 
And as Ored was facilitating this, we said, okay, workers and management, you split and think about what you want. The management was scared about what was the, the ask from the workers. They thought it was gonna be an incredible amount of salary increase. Workers came back and says, we want a covered parking lot for our bikes. And management says, what? We want a covered parking lot for our bikes. And they say, why? And they say, you see, our bikes is how we move around and how we do everything that we need to do. And if it rains, if it's, uh, there are any problems, we are worried. We are thinking about our bikes instead of thinking about our work. And that simple story is always in my mind because you don't know what it matters if you presume what the others are gonna ask you. It's that bike parking lot which was their dream. And it could be salaries, it could be something else, but only that dialogue will deliver what is gonna move you forward and will build trust. So that's my ask. Thank you, Marcella. And Yaya just told me we have three minutes, Lucas, so I'll end up with you. What's your take on everything that's been said? Ajá. Three minutes. Básicamente, yo creo que para que cualquier movimiento sea sostenible, cualquier eh, cambio sea sostenible, yo creo que las personas afectadas deben tener el control en la mano. Eh, soy uno de los fundadores de la coalición, pero la coalición no depende de, de, de mí. Somos un grupo. So uh, to me, one of the most important things for a movement like this to be effective and sustainable is that the people who are most affected by the problem must have the power in their hands. Eh, so as a, as I'm one of the co-founders of the CIW, but the CIW also doesn't depend just on me. We are a group of people and that power is shared. Los acuerdos por comida justa están en la industria lechera en Vermont. No dependen de la coalición de trabajadores de Mocali, dependen de los trabajadores que están en la industria lechera en Vermont y que tienen los acuerdos con Ben Jerry's. And, for example, one of the first replications of the Fair Food Program is the Milk with Dignity Program in the dairy industry in Vermont, and that doesn't depend on us as the farm workers from the CIW. That's the powers in the hands of migrant justice who are able to win their own agreements with Ben and Jerry's. Estamos trabajando para tal vez lanzar otro piloto también en la industria de pescado, eh, the fish industry en uh, el norte de, de eh, Europa, en Escocia y eh, Irlanda del Norte. Eh, y estamos trabajando con el ITF. Nosotros estamos ayudándoles, poniéndoles eh, las herramientas para que ellos sean los que los manejen, los trabajadores, no nosotros. Yo no sé nada de pescado, solamente lo sé comer. No sé cómo se cosecha, cómo, cómo se pesca. And then in another example of what it looks like for this model to grow, uh, we've been working for the last couple of years on a pilot replication of this model in the UK fishing industry. But our primary partner who originally approached us is ITF, uh, which is of course uh, an international federation of unions. And that's because they need to be the ones who are building that replication because they have the expertise. We certainly don't know, you know, and I don't know anything about fish except how to eat them. Um, and so, I, you know, the important thing in these replications and growth is that uh, the expertise remains with the workers who are actually in that industry. Y con el cambio climático, igual en la industria agrícola, estamos eh, trabajando para que exactamente los pesticidas que oh, ocasionan también mucho este cambio climático, no nada más se firme una ley y que dice, ya no se usan, porque se seguían usando. Hoy nos aseguramos de que realmente no se estén usando en la industria y a la misma vez creando protecciones para defender, para proteger nuestros eh, derechos y proteger nuestra salud debido al cambio climático, como tomando descansos cada dos horas en, en la temporada de calor. And then a final illustration of the importance of workers being at the head is the ability to, again, actually drive enforcement. Uh, so for example, um, in the Fair Food Program, we're able to respond and not only put into a standard that, for example, there should be a reduction in pesticide usage, which is 
you know, huge driving force um, of environmental degradation. But as workers, we're able to actually monitor and report when that is, uh, when those standards are violated. Or more recently, we've been able to adapt our standards and in the enforcement framework that we have to respond to climate change driven heat waves um, and to heat stress. And so we've been able to implement uh, protocols of having, for example, mandatory breaks every two hours during the hottest months of the year and actually enforce them as workers. Well, so how did you do such a phenomenal translation? I'm just, I, my, I, exactly, please. <laughs> I've never, you know, phenomenal. So well done, Lucas. <laughs> Exactly. Lucky. <laughs> I agree. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and for the great work that you do. This is just the beginning. We're not done yet. Panel two will look further into the future. We're going to discuss the new challenges or the continuing challenges. Um, John is going to moderate a brilliant panel. For those of you here in the room, there will be coffee. We're going to pause for 15 minutes and come back. For those of you who are joining online, don't go away. During this 15 minutes, if you want to have something to read for the next panel, IHRB, every December, on the 10th of December, we publish our top 10, which are our sort of forecasting for the year ahead, what we believe are the top 10 issues in the business and human rights agenda. This year, because of the 75th anniversary of the UDHR, we're looking further ahead. I have to say it's one of our best top 10s. You have time to read it in this 15 minutes. So go ihrb.org, I think it's slash top 10. Um, you'll find it there. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here. And thank, thank you, Marley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, welcome back, um, and to hello to everybody online. I hope you've had a chance to review the, the top 10 and uh, maybe have a drink of coffee, tea, whatever, or a glass of water, or, or whatever it needs to refresh. The second panel looks ahead the next 75 years, um, and I guess given where we are in the world and recent events, the weight of now uh, weighs heavily on all of us, I think, in the human rights, everybody, but particularly those of us thinking about where on earth do human rights go the next 75 years. But we've got a great panel to help us with this question, and I'll introduce them in a minute. Um, um, 75 years from now is 2098, right? That's... I mean, that, you might as well say end of the, uh, end of the century. I, look, here's a prediction. I won't be around then. Um, um, so, you know, are we going to make it to then? I remember at the turn of the millennium, the Astronomer Royal in the UK, uh, Martin Rees, wrote a book, and he gave humanity a 50% chance of surviving the century. Now, the good news is we're a quarter of the way through the century and we're still here. The, the more challenging news is, is, will we make the next 75 years? So in, in the face of all the existential challenges we face, um, they are many. Um, I won't list them all, but uh, top of mind, climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, poverty and inequality between nations and within nations, war and conflict, um, the dystopian effects of technology, uh, divisions and discrimination in society based on gender and many other forms of bias, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if we if if we could choose where to start, we wouldn't ch we wouldn't start from here, as 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 somebody once said. Where does human rights fit into this? Um, Eleanor Roosevelt talked about the factory 
the farm and the office. But I would contend, if we think about business now, it has pervaded our lives beyond the workplace. It controls the way we network with each other. Um, it is the conduit to a lot of what we do when we're not working. Um, it has, to some extent, broken into the privacy of our lives, our family lives, even the way we think, the level of autonomy that we have as individuals, perhaps even, you know, uh, what it means to be human, right? So maybe if Eleanor Roosevelt, if, it wasn't, if, if she was here and uh, she was making her 1958 speech, she would be talking about the places and spaces in which human rights has to become a reality. And I think, I th you know, even space itself, right? Which is space exploration is largely funded by who? CEOs of, of companies. So the role of business has certainly grown and has woven itself into our lives for better or, or for worse. Now, the context of today is one of economic decoupling and fragmentation. The challenge facing democracies. Next year, many of the world's democracies have their elections. Uh, in this country, in my own country, and elsewhere. I, I don't think any of you in this room needs any explanation as to why that's so challenging. But that's the context in which business and human rights sits. And then also the changing nature of workplaces and the meaning of work itself. In the next 75 years, a lot of the jobs we've talked about, the factory, the farm, and the workplace will be automated, possibly, done by machines, done by computers. New types of work might come to the fore, but, it, but possibly in the next 75 years, the very idea of what work is uh, will change. So I'm going to introduce off, well, I'll introduce all the guests now, and then, and then we'll get going. Priyanka Motopathy is Director of Armed Conflict, Counterterrorism, Human Rights uh, at Columbia University Law School. Priyanka, hi. Ian Levine is Director of Policy Initiatives uh, at the Human Rights Policy bit of Meta, formerly known as Facebook, I think. Um, Haley St. Dennis is standing in for Mandy. Haley is our Head of Just Transitions, just back from COP28. And um, Usha Ramanathan, Professor Usha Ramanathan, um, are you in the UAE now, Usha, at the Sarja University, or are you in India? Where, where are you talking to us from? I'm in India. You're in India. India. Usha is known to many of us, um, long specialized in issues of human rights, poverty, and gender. Um, so let's start with you, Priyanka. Conflict has come up already in conversation. What, what does the next 75 years have in store, do you think? Sure. So first of all, I want to thank you so much, John and Salil and everyone at the Institute of Human Rights and Business for, for having me on this panel. It's such an honor to be here with all of you and with the group we have today and to really take the opportunity not just to focus on our daily tasks or the slice of work we have in front of us, but really to take that 10,000 foot view of the human rights field, the role of armed conflict within it, and how business ties into these spaces. <clears throat> and given the occasion, I wanted to indulge myself a little bit um, by, by starting my remarks with a quote from one of my favorite writers, the Argentinian novelist and writer, uh, Argentine French, uh, Julio Cortazar. And he asked, why have we had to invent Eden to live submerged in the nostalgia of a lost paradise, to make up utopias, propose a future for ourselves? At the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, our main task is not to look backwards. Instead, as Cortesar says, we must propose a future for ourselves. Where we've been, why we've reached that place, it's important in history, but our task is to look forward and to meet the transformative change challenges, many of which you've referenced, that we're facing at this moment in time. And I wanted also to, to bring in a framework developed by Cesar Rodriguez Gavirito, who's a human rights scholar uh, and advocate based at NYU. He highlights five existential challenges to human rights at this time. 
of which business is implicated in all. But I'll highlight three in particular. The first, technological challenge, how rapid shifts in technology strip us of privacy and reliable information. And of course, this is deeply consequential in armed conflict contexts. A second challenge that he highlights, the ecological challenge, which Haley will discuss more, but essentially is climate and environmental crisis disrupting basic conditions of life and therefore human rights. Again, deeply involved with business, deeply involved with armed conflict as well. Climate change and environmental crisis are drivers of armed conflict. Um, and of course, environmental crisis is also a consequence or sort of ripple effect, <clears throat> if you will, of conflict in many situations. Finally, he highlights a socioeconomic challenge, rising poverty and inequality. Uh, which is also deeply connected to some of the issues we discussed in our previous channel around workers' rights, around fairness, around modern-day slavery, around you know, what a just and fair economy could look like. In raising these challenges, Gaverito asks us not to consider the short or even the medium term, but to think through the generational impact of these challenges, which is, of course, the conversation we're engaged in today, thinking about the past 75 years, but really the next 75 years, where and where we want to go. So I'll focus, I'll focus my remarks on three focal areas in which some of these challenges are deeply intertwined, particularly when speaking of armed conflict. And they're deeply intertwined with the theme of this panel, the frontiers where business leadership can play a key, key role. These three focal areas are weapons, the, the subject of migrant workers, the rights of migrant workers, and technology. <clears throat> I wanted to call it weapons, workers, and the web, but that felt a little too cheesy. I shied away from that alliteration. Okay, so turning to the topic of weapons, and particularly as this panel takes place in New York, in the United States, uh, thinking through two of the major conflicts that are you know, in our news today, dominating headlines, that in the Ukraine and that in Gaza, in which the United States plays a key role. The United States is the biggest arms dealer on earth. From 2017 to 2021, it sold weapons to more than 100 nations. It accounts for more than 40% of the global arms trade, um, and that, percentage, that, that is old. It is only likely to increase with the explosion of transfers to Ukraine and to Israel. The five top arms manufacturing companies, they are all US companies. And then you have the economic incentive where the more weapons US companies sell, the cheaper it is to sell them per weapon. And of course, the government itself provides huge economic incentives to our arms manufacturers. One of the things I think we have to be aware of is at the same time we are marking this anniversary of the UDHR, we also have to acknowledge that during the period of adoption, it is the same period during which the US began significantly scaling up its arms production, a trend that has continued until this day. How do weapons relate to human rights? It may seem obvious. Arms, when we think of the arms trade, weapons are not self-regulating. They don't have a human rights safety catch. There are no protections or safeguards built in, and we have seen the consequences of this in many situations. Weapons which may be intended for one party or one particular foreign policy goal, because of course recognizing that weapons sales and arms trade is a huge component of US foreign policy. It's not just a pillar of the economy, although that's a key element as well, but it is a huge component of US foreign policy. Um, but so often the weapons that the US and certainly that other countries as well sell abroad may be intended for a particular party and a particular foreign policy goal. Um, but very often they don't stay with that party and they don't continue to serve only that goal. And these weapons last for decades. Um, in some cases like cluster munitions, the remnants can last for decades causing harm to children who are attracted to the colorful and shiny objects they present. <clears throat> In other cases, the weapons are, you know, fall into the hands of other, other armed groups, whether by way of capture or by deliberate transfer, um, and no longer either serve foreign policy goals and certainly don't serve human rights um, in any way. Okay. 
second, I want to turn to the topic of migrant workers. It's vital from a business perspective to think about how conflict, migration, and labor are intertwined. According to the ICRC, there are more than 100 conflicts around the world, and we see again and again how migrant workers, workers who have traveled to countries for jobs, whether those are already in conflict or you know, come into a period of armed conflict during their period of employment, these workers fall through the cracks. They receive inadequate protection. They face particular dangers and isolation when conflict breaks out. We saw in the conflict in Ukraine, for example, how African migrants, students, and workers faced racist abuse at the borders when they were trying to escape. They were subject to beatings, and many of them were turned away from crossing those borders. We now see negotiations in Israel as they try to replace Palestinian workers who are supporting the construction sector and other parts of the economy. And in India, there have been statement, statements by 10 major trade unions who have called on the Indian government to refuse the request made by Israel's construction sector. Labor is more fungible than ever, and yet we are stuck, we are sort of still living with the colonial perspective that black and brown bodies are useful for work, but do not enjoy the same rights as other workers, that we are commodities to be controlled. This needs to shift, and businesses can play a key role. Finally, I want to turn to the topic of technology, which I know that Ian will discuss further, but I'll just touch on its role in armed conflict in particular. We are seeing the explosion of mis- and disinformation across social media platforms, particularly with the end of the human rights team at Twitter. They were immediately removed when Elon Musk took over um, Twitter, what is now known as X as well as the increasing volume of information disseminated across social media platforms, the information environment we live in is under threat. We no longer consume news in the same way. The days of someone opening up their front door or you know, turning to their mailbox and picking up a single or few paper newspapers, those are long behind us. Each of us consumes news and information through a huge panoply of sources uh, many of them online, uh, some of them very difficult to verify, and trends and stories can spread like wildfire. Tech platforms can play a helpful role, but they can also play a deeply harmful role, allowing calls to violence and hate speech to spread, allowing false information to spread with lightning speed. There's a lot of advocacy being done to platforms, but there's little compelling these platforms to act. Um, and I look forward to discussing that more and, and hearing Ian's perspective on that as well. So I wanted, you asked me to speak a little bit as well about what we can find that's hopeful. And I think in a moment where there is such chagrin at the state of the international world order, at the state of the international human rights system, I often come back myself in my own reflections and searching for solutions, so searching for sources of power, to the concept of solidarity. What do we mean by solidarity? By, by solidarity, I mean either an expression or an act which shows support for or you know, uplifts causes of social justice and human rights. So how can the human rights movement meet the moment that we're in? I would argue that one way is by using tactics of global solidarity. We can say that solidarity animated the development of the UDHR. A member of the drafting subcommittee reflected that there was an atmosphere of genuine solidarity at the time of its adoption. Of course, that person was speaking of solidarity amongst states. But solidarity can also operate at a range of different levels. It can operate at a movement level. It can operate between nations. And I think we need to interrogate as well, can solidarity apply across, generation, across generations? Particularly when we're thinking of the climate crisis, some of the other crises or challenges that we've identified, I think we need to engage more with this idea of cross-generational solidarity and what that can look like in practice. So I think I'll pause there um, and just end with the thought that I think it's essential for each of us to examine what solidarity means, what we can learn from the past, and how we can creatively and nimbly apply that to the future.
Thank you, Priyanka. Brilliant. Um, we'll come back to solidarity as a panel, I think, when everybody's spoken. Um, we're seeing at IHRB, not surprisingly, perhaps, a huge upswing in interest around issues of business and conflict. Um, a, a need to look again on the work on international humanitarian law, criminal law, work that perhaps most of which happened 15, 20 years ago and hasn't happened so much recently needs to happen again. But Priyanka, I just thought, and maybe this will come to Ian a, a bit as well, but you talk a bit about weapons and human rights, right? Um, there was quite a discussion around you know, the, 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 the beginnings of the use of cluster bombs, right, in the Ukraine context. Uh, there's been a long discussion, and I'm sure Ian might comment on this in terms of drones. Um, is it, does it make any sense at all to talk about binding human rights standards and certain forms of weapons, or, or, or is it all gloves off now? Is, is, is the conversation of even two years ago <laughs> sort of sliding away now, or, or, or do you see some hope in us being able to have a sort of weapons and human rights uh, discussion that will be binding. I mean, I think certainly in this area, there are already binding, you know, either human rights or humanitarian law provisions that we can look to. There is also, there are also international instruments. Um, so there is, uh, there is an international treaty around cluster munitions. But they're being used in Ukraine by both sides now, right? I, yes, that's my yeah. understanding. So, you know, I think the challenge was in the negotiation of that instrument and some of the compromises that were made, um, which didn't create an absolute ban. Um, and there are certain circumstances in which weapons that are inherently indiscriminate can nevertheless be used in a limited way. And I think the challenge comes up when they're not used in that very limited and circumscribed way. Um, for example, with landmines, another example of an inherently indiscriminate weapon, efforts to, you know, enforce a global ban on them. Um, but, you know, some, some challenges in negotiation there and certainly challenges in implementation. We had an event at Columbia a few weeks ago with um, advocates from Southeast Asia talking about how in Laos, for example, and other parts of Southeast Asia, um, there are still the remnants of these uh, unexploded munitions causing harm even to children. Uh, so it is a long-standing problem. Um, but I don't know that we need new instruments so much as we need a commitment to upholding the protections against inherently indiscriminate weapons already right. um, and to really respect the, the limits on their use. Right. Thanks for that. Ian. Technology, um, bright new future. Um, I mean, we, Facebook, I think, was relatively slow to come to the table on issues around human rights and privacy. But this is before your time. That might not be a fair criticism, but it certainly fe felt quite a while. But, you, but Meta is definitely at the table now. How do you see technology spinning into these next 75 years? It feels such a big part of human rights these days that the Universal Declaration itself perhaps should have had an article on technology if we'd known, right? But the floor's yours. Thanks so much. It's great to be here, and, and thanks to all who've been part of uh, putting the panel together. Um, uh, there's a line from Homer Simpson. I know we've had a lot of very high-level quotes. I'm going to lower the tone. <laughs> Homer Simpson, who says, uh, to alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. And I kind of feel the same way about technology. Sometimes we see it, we see it as both, in increasingly so. Um, and as Priyanka said, you know, it, there's no question that when we look at the existential challenges facing the movement, climate, technology, and equality, I totally agree, are, are, are up there. Um, so, you know, have tech companies been slower than they should at recognizing their human rights responsibilities? Probably so. Um, um, and obviously the, the, the ending of the human rights team at X was, was uh, very distressing. But I, I, I do think that it, it, there, is, there is progress, there is, there is growing recognition um, that um, given tech's incredibly powerful impact in the world, and I'll come to conflict in a second because you're absolutely right to flag it as being a particularly challenge, but we obviously increasingly exercise our rights online, we, and we're increasingly seeing risks to those rights online, whether it be privacy, if you suggested, but also through hate speech, misinformation, disinformation, 
um, um, bullying and harassment, incitement to violence, and, uh, and so on. And, and I think as we, as we reflect on universality um, and the fragmentation of universality, which was touched upon quite a lot in the, in, in, in the previous um, panel, and as we reflect on well, when I think about uh, uh, several remarks that were made earlier, including by Salil and Marcella, who talked about the struggle to figure out how each and every one of us recognizes our human rights responsibilities and not just kind of delegates it to government or to companies, but thinks what it means for us all as individuals, whether we're individuals in civil society, working within companies or, or, or within governments. I, I think there is enormous um, importance for us reflecting on the ways in which uh, technologies are evolving and the, and the ways in which standards uh, are evolving and the ways in which the application of the UN guiding principles and, and, and the UDHR and the Bill of Rights can be done. And one of the big challenges we face is obviously, and this is no news to anyone here, I'm sure, I mean, it was very much encapsulated by a, a remark made by Isaac Asimov, the, the science fiction writer, 40 years ago. Well, I mean, so long before our current digital revolution, but he said, you know, the saddest aspect of life right now is that uh, uh, technology advances knowledge far more quickly than, than society advances wisdom. And if we see human rights as a proxy for wisdom, um, I think it's, it's a challenge that is increasingly uh, 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 pertinent and relevant today, particularly as we think about just in the last 12 months how much Gen AI has evolved and the kinds of, op both the opportunities and the risks that, that it offers. The technology them. can't increase wisdom. I think it can and does. Uh, 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 well, it certainly, I think, has enormous potential. I mean, I'm the father of two teenage kids, and I see how much smarter than they are than I am. Is that wisdom? Part, part of it is wisdom. Part of it is just knowledge and awareness because they're, they, they're exposed to the world through social media in a way I wasn't. But I do think they have insights, um, uh, and I think many in their generation have insights that, that, that my generation doesn't. Solidarity, Priyanka's point about solidarity. Yeah, and I think it's a really interesting uh, idea, and it, to me it goes to one of the sort of the big challenges that I've been thinking a lot about on a personal level in the last three and a half years since I switched from years working, or decades working with the UN and human rights NGOs to the, to the tech sector and thinking about the, 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 the challenges. And there's a couple of, I think, things that are, I've been thinking about that are relevant to solidarity. One is, one of, so when I moved to Meta, I had to think about and learn about the human rights issues uh, generated both the, both the, the, the positive and, and the risks generated by technology. But I also had to figure out how to be an activist within a company, how to be able to work inside a, a large company with 65,000 or whatever it is employees, and how to be able to not just talk about human rights, but make human rights relevant to all my colleagues, whether they are computer scientists or data scientists or on the business side or corporate lawyers or whoever they may, may be. And that's really, it's about solidarity. It's about sitting down with people who come from a different place with a different training and have a different role, but figuring out how can human rights be something that binds you together? How can human rights be something that we all recognize we have a responsibility for, whatever our job title is? And I think that as, as we think about the evolution of the business and human rights movement, figuring out how we more and more evolve our sophistication in engaging across every part of a company and making human rights responsibilities real at an individual level as well as at an institutional level is really important. And the second thing that it makes me think a lot about is the ways in which we engage from outside and from within companies and the ways in which we can create solidarity around our commitments to human rights, whether our role is to critique from outside or to push for change from inside. On that, because I've done it both ways too, and I think there's people who stay outside fear that people like you and I that go in are co-opted somehow, that we're, we're lost to the movement. Um, is that still the view? I mean, now you might not agree with that now, you're working for Meta, but can it work, the human rights movement that's both within and without companies? 
Um, I, I mean, I hear that all the time. Right? People often say to me, do you miss being a human rights activist? And I say, but I still am. And they go, no, you're not, because you work for Meta, right? Um, now, it's, it's for others to say whether I've been co-opted. I, I, can't, I can't answer for that. But do I believe that we can create a stronger movement by thinking about ways in which we, we can w work together from inside and outside? I, and can we do better? I absolutely believe we can. Now, it, uh, and, and that's not to say that um, there's not more we should be doing from, from within and pushing our companies to do more and thinking about how to make all the strongest arguments around regulation, reputation, and so on. But I believe there's still room for us to advance um, in, 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 in how we strategize to um, push companies f forward around Are you interested in, Usha, when we come to you in a minute, Usha, what your view on this question about the, the in and out of, of companies, because uh, we've had this conversation in other places. But Ian, finish. I'm, I mean, I keep interrupting you because it's so interesting. That's uh, sorry about that. But uh. no, no. I, and I mean, the, the last point. Make I, it a conversation. The last point I was going to make. You sort of you've you've led me to, but maybe just make, make, make a last point. I, when when COVID began, um, and my wife and I were both working at home, and she works in international public health. And it was the first time I'd ever listened into her conference calls because we normally work in office. Revelation, isn't it? And it was fascinating. And like about five times a day, I wanted to run up the stairs to the bedroom and say, no, <laughs> no, you haven't made the human rights argument yet. And it, it just made me think a lot about the importance of human rights activists thinking about the spaces that we want to be part of <coughs> to advance the ideals. Um, whether it's within environmental organizations, uh, uh, public health organizations, you know, companies, economic development organizations, I, I, we, we, we have to be in the right places. I'm really excited to see how many human rights people have gone to COP because it's an incredibly important place for us to be um, as, 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 as human rights activists. And um, I just want to be part of more conversations about how we take our skills, our expertise, our commitment, to places where we can make a difference beyond the sort of the self-identified human rights groups. Very good. Um, so we've had solidarity from Priyanka. I think from you, Leon, I'm hearing um, all the peculiar places, if you like, <laughs> this idea that human rights doesn't just belong in Human Rights Watch or in the Ford Foundation, but it belongs in many, many places. And that might actually be part of the success or something we can look forward to. Hayley, you've just come from COP28. Um, I would call you a human rights activist. Um, where, given, I think we, the first COP we went to was Glasgow two years ago, there does seem to be a much larger human rights contingent now of many different stripes um, at, in the climate piece. How big, how, how will these environmental issues shape the way we think about the UDHR and business mm. and human rights moving forward? Yeah, for, for me, if we're boiling things down to single words, it's... We are, we are doing that. It's, it's quite integration. Yeah. When it comes to climate and human rights, that is the word that is what is at stake for getting it right on any level. Um, and I think we're seeing a little more of that each year at COP. That's where I get the most sense of solidarity, frankly, is when I see the indigenous leaders or the worker leaders battling against the kind of chaos and noise that otherwise is so stark at COP and the capture that we're increasingly seeing of that very important policy arena. So integration is, is where it, it sort of sits for me. And um, I guess when it comes to sort of thinking about the future of human rights in the context of climate, it's really important to start by acknowledging that we live, yes, in an overly carbonized world, but also a deeply, deeply unequal one. And those two things compound. Um, IHRB is very lucky to call Mary Robinson our patron. She was our founding chair. And for a very long time, she has been saying that climate change is the greatest threat to human rights of the 21st century. And despite that, I think many human rights activists and IHRB among them are quite new to this game of climate and how to really... There are a lot of horses in the race, aren't there? There are, but... It's the human rights movement, would you Yeah, say? and it's, I, you know, it's, an, it's an imperative of not reinventing the wheel. Because as with climate solutions, right, we know what, we, what they are and what is needed. We also know what is needed on the social side. But maybe I'll just take a step back for a second, give a sense of numbers and scale. Um, because in quite a qualitative field, I think numbers can actually really help capture what's at stake. And so 
globally, there has been, over the last 20 years, a 134% increase in flood-related climate-fueled disasters, right? We're currently living through the hottest year on record. And it often hits those least responsible for contributing to the emissions pie, right? And so people in highly vulnerable areas are 15 more times more likely to die in floods than those living in climate resilient spaces. Um, if unmitigated climate change will contribute another 130 million people into poverty in the next 10 years alone. Um, that'll lead to mass displacement and migration, as we know. The World Bank estimating another 216 million could have to migrate internally by 2050. And that's with 1.6 billion already living food insecure, that would add another 80 million to that. And all of this is happening at a time when 4.1 billion people, or more than half the population, aren't covered by any form of social protection. So that's what it's, what's at stake when we're talking about climate justice and the impacts that are happening from the climate crisis itself. And as I say, we know what we need to do. We know that we need to map it, massively deploy renewables. We need to cut fossil fuels and we need to adapt. And sort of the challenge comes with the enormous speed and scale required to do that in time. So the, the kind of catchphrase at COP right now is a tripling up and a doubling down. A tripling up of renewables and a doubling down of sort of energy efficiency. But that doesn't actually even come close to what's needed. It's kind of a catchy catchphrase that people remember, but the science tells us that just in the next seven years, we need a fourfold increase in wind and solar, 18 times the number of EVs sales, three to six times the current levels of climate finance investment, all while reducing the energy intensity of GDP by 4% per annum. So I guess, again, to underscore the importance of speed and scale, because if, if that happens as quickly as it needs to, but isn't managed well from a social perspective, the disorder will be so it'll be, it'll be something we've never seen before, right? The scale of impact that could come from that speed is enormous, and, and it'll hit every type of sort of potentially affected worker, or uh, sorry, a potentially affected um, stakeholder that we can think of, right? For workers, which are, are often sort of synonymous with just transitions, it is a concept that was really pioneered by the trade union movement over the last several decades. Um, we know from the ILO that they're estimating 80 million jobs lost in this transition but also 100 million jobs created. And so that gives you a sense of the, the sort of varying ways that employment by, might be impacted, right? Some new jobs will be created, some might be substituted, certain will be eliminated, and almost all will be transformed. And that won't happen evenly. It'll concentrate in specific regions and communities. Um, some industries will decline, some will grow, some will radically transform, and all of that spells radically new ways of producing, working, consuming, and living. Indigenous groups are fighting for, I think, a similar place in the Just Transitions conversation. Um, I think they're overlooked, really, both in terms of the impacts that can occur, but also their role in driving solutions. And there's a really incredible statistic, again, numbers, that tells us that half of the world's land is governed by indigenous populations. And of this, around 80% it represents about 80% of our remaining biodiversity. So one in three people on the planet is dependent on these lands in some way for their well-being and livelihood. That's an astonishing figure. And at the same time, we know that only 10% of indigenous land tenure is recognized under national law. And only 1% of climate finance goes to indigenous leaders. So the mismatch there couldn't be greater. Um, likewise, we heard mention of human rights defenders earlier. I think, Marcella, you brought them in. They are facing intolerable risks. We're only seeing that go up at the moment. There were trackers counted 177 murders last year, 415 violent attacks, and a massive increase in criminalization as a silencing strategy. The, the sort of scale of risk I'm trying to paint here is one of a double-edged sword, right? So people are getting hit on the front end with climate vulnerabilities and these extreme shocks and weather events that are just increasing. And then they're also hit on the back end by poor transition policies that don't center them and their voice. And it's not to say that we need to give them voice because they have voice. It's about them having a seat at the table in everything we heard in the last panel. Um, the problem, I think, is a lot of policymakers are paralyzed. They're caught between 
short-term domestic economic pressure and long-term choices about future well-being. And I think that really sums up COP right now. And that's really at odds with everything we're talking about here today, which is very slow, very painstaking, very patient work to actually give agency to those most affected. And that doesn't play well in election cycles, and it doesn't show well in quarterly reporting. And so we're going to, I think, see in the future pace and progress come even more starkly into conflict as this rolls out. And, and that's in part because fear really is taking hold in many communities around the world. And, and that's a very powerful motivator in decision making, right? And if people feel left behind with no say over their future, that will drive social disruption, protests, boycotts, and it'll slow climate action as a result. So the answer from IHRB's perspective, certainly, and I think so many people that really see value in the Just Transitions conversation is human rights. It is the fact that the J in JT is the key to the T, right? To, to actually do this well, to enable fast and efficient climate action means having these different groups I've mentioned at the table. Um, and we need to see that reflected at sort of all forms of governance. And, you know, ultimately I think the test for the next 75 years will be, can we use this moment to finally internalize the social costs of all this economic activity? Because again, as we heard in the last panel, and as I think many of us know just from history books, is that the externalization of these costs is why so many of us work in business and human rights. You know, the sort of shame cycle Lucas spoke about earlier. So I guess I'll leave it at that, but, but sort of final reflection from IHRB's work so far on this is, what we've come to find really is this is, this is often sort of 90% political, 10% technical. It really is a matter of agency, power, and political will, and finding new ways of actually shaking up business models and ensuring that that's actually distributed in a different way that takes advantage of this opportunity that could be at hand. Thank you, Haley. So you've given us the integration point, which we're seeing reflected in a lot of the climate financial disclosure standards that are coming out, mandatory due diligence and other things that are coming through in Europe and elsewhere, the climate and human rights pillars either sitting apart or, or increasingly sitting together. But you've also put the question of pace and time frame. The, 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 the climate and the planet, in a way, it's, it's two things, really, that, that seem to sit uneasily with each other. The need to, to transition incredibly quickly um, but also to take an intergenerational approach to these things in the way that indigenous people have done for thousands of years. So, so even that sort of contradictory message within the sort of the, the, the climate justice movement, you know, the green imperative, yeah. let's work, work out the social stuff later when yeah. we get to 2050, but also indigenous people say, who have probably the least role to play in global warming, that, that actually, they've always taken an intergenerational issue mm -hmm. to these questions. But, I mean, we'll come back to you, if that's all right. Usha, you've been very patient. Uh, you're on a big screen looking down at us, um, exuding wisdom, <laughs> as always. Um, from your perspective, you work long on issues that I, that I mentioned in your introduction. I'd love to know what you think about the things that have been said already and, and also your perspectives for the next 75 years. Thank you. Can you hear me? I just want to start with uh, the context of poverty. Uh, it is, we need a bit uh, more volume. I, I think, think we've learned here that poverty is not really a static concept. Uh, Go ahead, Dushan. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. A bit of a delay, I think, but go ahead. Uh, that poverty is not a static concept that we have to understand it in terms of processes of impoverishment, where people who are powerless, economically powerless, politically powerless, um, and you know, find themselves placed where uh, vulnerabilities increase. So we also have, especially in the context of uh, indigenous people, like we call them Adivasis here, that the uh, idea of induced vulnerability, for instance, mining induces vulnerability. Fencing off resources from them induces vulnerability. So the relationship that states have with resources 
sometimes they are just for their process of development. Sometimes because they are asking companies to be partners in that process of development. A lot of the time, in fact, uh, we find that that produces various conditions of poverty from which it's very difficult for people to, you know, to rise, to get out of it. Uh, and I really think we need to understand the context of induced vulnerability. I think one of the very uh, important concepts that was developed in the context of business and human rights is the idea of complicity. Uh, I think we do need to apply it more and more, but I think it's also, especially with technology coming, uh, you know, coming into our world the way it has, it's more than merely complicity, there are partnerships between states and uh, companies which are resulting in huge violations of rights of, uh, rights of people. So that's just one, one context. Uh, I really think climate change is something that, you know, we've talked about it for 30, 30, you know, 30 35 years now, at least 30 years. Everyone around the world knows what, it, uh, what it's about. And it's almost like talking so much about it has made us accept that it is just you know, a condition of life, and therefore we just carry on. I live in Delhi, and I can tell you that, you know, the normalizing of the kind of pollution that there is in Delhi, where, you know, more people are dying of uh, cancer every year, lung cancer has just been increasing, but then we just walk out and we walk into that smog, and it's almost like a form of helplessness, which can't be the condition of human life. Uh, so, but in, uh, the third is on technology. I mean, I have a lot to say on technology, but I'll just say a little bit. Uh, I think, you know, one of the, in, in the UDHR, there is a thing on what, you know, on uh, fundamental human rights, in which we talk about the dignity and worth of the human person. I think it's one of the tragedies of our times that something like technology, which is produced in our midst, saying that it's going to improve our lives, it's going to make things very much easier, and uh, that there will be very much more that we'll get from it. Uh, like it was said a while ago, that it will produce knowledge for us. All of this is uh, proving to be very elusive. And part of the reason seems to be not that technology is inherently good or bad, but that people who are controlling these technologies and are looking for their power and their profit through these technologies and control. I mean, like I've been told very often, we need to think of this as an age of surveillance. We need to think of, of mass surveillance and recognize that this is an age where uh, governments and companies want to control people and, people and their lives. I don't think we can take it lightly. I don't think this can. Uh, this is something that we can wait to deal with. It's also very important that the idea of innovation has been brought in our midst. We are working a little bit on the philosophy for technology. And we find that the idea of innovation and the idea that innovation should not be con you know, constricted by rules. Uh, and the whole UDHR is about how you're going to you know, contain power through rules. And in a, you know, technology controllers and creators say that they don't want rules because you know, it will stifle innovation. That's one part of it. And the other part, that, and you know, regardless of whether it violates fun, you know, human rights, fundamental rights or not, because you just have to wait and then you have to write the rules around the technology that you uh, produce. So that's one kind of thing. And the other is the extent to which companies have felt that it's fine and states have felt that it's fine to experiment on whole populations. And we have seen, for instance, we've seen it in India and now it's, you know, it's being uh, exported to many countries. Many countries are adopting biometrics uh, as a means of identifying persons who need welfare. Uh, persons who need welfare are treated like it's some kind of largest that's being handed out to them, and if they don't give up part of their human rights, then they are not entitled to what, you know, what is seen as entitlement. Otherwise, it's a terrible situation that we are seeing now. It's very difficult to think benignly about, uh, you know, to think of technology as benign. And I think it's for technology providers and technology creators and controllers to change this event by changing what technology will come to be. I think one of the things that shook me at one time was the idea of I mean, human augmentation, where they say that the human being needs to be augmented by an interface with a machine. Apart from everything else, it also shows the way in which we are being taught to think about, about ourselves as less, and therefore we can only become even partway you know, worthy of life if we are going to interface with the machine. It's a very strange kind of imagination that's being in, 
produced and it's being produced for a purpose. So I think it really, really needs a lot of uh, interrogation. I think at a time like now, we cannot not talk about war. And, uh, you know, when the International Criminal Court was being discussed, debated through all the prep comms, the, you know, when the idea was, and it was hoped, that there would be a lessening of mass crime, of crimes against humanity, of war crimes, of genocide, that there would be one more, uh, you know, one more level of control over this kind of, uh, uh, you know, this kind of proliferation of mass crime. But it seems that hasn't happened. And we, we are seeing a normalizing. And I think for some of us, it's really terrifying to think that the whole world, because of technology, the whole world watches the war as it's uh, happening. And nobody seems to be able to stop it. There is something wrong uh, you know, with controllers of all of this if they find that they can't, you know, that there are, there are no other ways other than letting a war happen. So that, I think we really need to think a lot about that. The two words that I was interested in in the conversation that happened, now, one was utopia. And I must say that I think utopia is a really bad idea because Ut utopia. Is, somebody's utopia is a nightmare for somebody else. And we've seen what utopia has produced. And intergeneration. I think if uh, in all these years since the UDHR, if we've not managed to get generations who've been in various conditions of poverty and powerlessness and direness. If you've not managed to get them out of that situation, I think there is something wrong in the way in which we've been working our human rights in, you know, in our own societies. <clears throat> Thank you, Usha. Thank you. I want to pick up on one thing you said there um, about biometrics and sort of human autonomy, because you could make a case that, that human autonomy is part of the problem, right? Yes. Um, UDHR is framed on a sort of set of libertarian principles or this fine balance between the rights of the individual balanced against the, the, the state and to make sure the state is not overbearing. And But given where we are in the world, given the decisions people are making even in democracies to elect people um, uh, that perhaps are making short-term but not long-term decisions, perhaps decisions that favor some groups over other groups, and from the environmental perspective, Haley, next year China will, China's um, carbon emissions will start falling next year, right? So I often hear it said, to get to net zero by 2050, how much autonomy, how many rights do we need to trade to get to that place? You know, given lots of decisions have to be made, planning decisions in democratic countries take a lot longer than they do in non-democratic countries, right? Um, is autonomy part of the problem? Do you think in the next 75 years we'll be trading aspects of our rights to safeguard other aspects of our rights? Um, I don't know, anybody want to come in on that or anything else you've heard each other say? I don't want to, but it, just something that Usha mentioned in, in the context of biometrics I, and, and the right to privacy was quite interesting. Ian, do you want to go first? I'm neither lawyer nor philosopher, so I feel... You sounded like a philosopher earlier, <laughs> I feel a bit out of my depth, but it, it's a great question. And I just want to just touch on a couple of things that Usha said that I think were really, really important. I'm really happy she, she emphasized the, the word dignity, which I think is, is a very sort of... Un, we don't talk enough about dignity as, as, as being the fundamental basis for the UDHR and, and everything that was built upon it. It's the idea of the dignity and worth of every human life for, for, for its own sake. And it's, it's hugely undervalued as a, uh, it's hugely, it's not talked about enough. And so I, I really thank her for, 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 for raising it. Um, and clearly it's something that has massive implications for, for technology. I think technology has both enormous has capacity to do both good and obviously very bad things in, in, for human dignity. To your point, to your specific question, one of the reasons I think I've been so pessimistic and depressed um, about the kind of state of the world's human rights over the last, particularly over the last two or three months, uh, um, has been this idea that we're losing, that we have lost uh, the, the, this idea of universality. Uh, the, 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 the idea that human rights for all their imperfections and for all the ways that we may argue about the best way to implement them represent shared values. 
and I'm increasingly pessimistic about whether or not they are shared values across political spectrums and across you know a whole host of of, of other factors. Um, and I, I think that one of the biggest challenges we face, whether it's sort of in the business and human rights world or, or more broadly, is to reclaim the idea that they can and must be shared moral values. They're codified in law, but they are shared moral values that inevitably require some give and take. Yes, I mean, you look at, you know, fundamental human rights ideal moving away from UDHR, Article 20 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Articles 19 and 20, which talk about freedom of expression, obviously hugely important to a, to a company like Meta. You know, on the one hand, Article 19, absolutely at the heart of the entire human rights infrastructure, defines freedom of expression. But then Article 20 reminds us that there are times when governments have an obligation to restrict it and legitimately can and must do so. I mean, so the idea that, that there, are, there are limitations, that there are counters, that there, is, there has to be some, some give and take, there has to be some balance, I think is embedded into the, into the, into the, the codification of the values. Um, what we're seeing in so many societies around the world today is an intense polarization which makes those conversations increasingly challenging. As we've just seen in, in, in the US, even just in the last three or four days with the furore over the testimony by university presidents in front of Congress um, and, and just the extraordinary political ramifications that have evolved around that. Great. I'm going to pr give Priyanka and Haley a chance to reflect on this and then we'll come to any of you who want to ask questions either online or in the room. Priyanka, let's not get too depressed, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think your question around, you know, do we have to give up some autonomy is such an interesting way to look at it. And I keep thinking back to Marcella's point in that prior panel, you know, each of the challenges that we described, technological, ecological, climate related, um, even armed conflict related, uh, these challenges are not really individual challenges. They're collective challenges. And if I have one critique of the UDHR, it's that it really conceives of rights as linked to individuals, individual bodies. Um, and I think what we have to take forward is a vision of human rights for a collective. And that's not to say that, you know, I mean, there is a collective way of imagining the UDHR, right? A society in which everyone enjoys these rights. Um, but what we're really talking about are, you know, human rights challenges and threats that will affect each and every one of us without exception. The climate crisis will affect each and every one of us. It will not affect us equally. It will not affect us in the same ways, but certainly everyone will be impacted in some way. When we speak of technology, threats to privacy, for example. That utilitarianism, or is it, you, you seem to be going in a utilitarian direction. No, I don't think so at all, because it's not my argument that we should sacrifice autonomy, but we each have a self-interest here, right? To protect ourselves, to protect our families, to protect our communities, to protect our polities, whatever those look like. Um, and so I think through that desire to protect things that are meaningful to us, we have to move towards a collective vision of what human rights can look like and what those protections look like. Great. Okay, Haley. And then if anybody has a question in the room, come to the microphone. And Usha, as well. Usha, I'll come to you after Haley. And then um, Salih, if there's any online as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I suppose what I would say now is it's all to be played for. So in that sense, I find it incredibly heartening. And it could go a number of directions, right? But I think what's happening at the moment, at least from the sort of lens of climate, is almost a fundamental renegotiation of sort of social contract at multiple levels, right? You've got the global north and the global south deeply, you know, at loggerheads right now as we speak in Dubai, thrashing out, you know, high-level climate policy, and we're seeing that play out in real time. You then have individual nations sort of renegotiating what well-being looks like with their people in, again, through the lens of decarbonization, adaptation, and what it means to actually be resilient to this slightly dystopian future ahead of us. And then you also have companies that are actually going to be the drivers of so much of this industrial system shift, needing to think about what that sort of contract looks like with their workers, with their communities, and others. So it's hard to predict where it's going to go. But again, to your point of solidarity and the fact that we will all be affected in some way, it means we all have a voice and a stake in, in how to try and see where those three different interconnected 
negotiations land. So sort of a systems analysis placed Absolutely. on human rights in yeah. a way. Yeah. yeah. Usha, you were either nodding or you, know, you want to come in. We, yeah. It's just a little bit because you, are, you spoke about autonomy and having to give, give up uh, rights so that we can set some of the problems around us uh, in, in, I mean, we can set them right. I actually think the problem is how we view this because it's not like... Can we turn Usha up a little bit? She's very quiet. Sorry. Keep going, Usha, but maybe with a bit more volume at this end. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, no, I was saying that, you know, this question of trading rights, it makes sense if I have the power to decide and to negotiate and to be in the debate and discussion on any of this. I think the great thing about human rights uh, jurisprudence has been that it focuses on those who have least power. And therefore, these instruments have to come in to protect those you know, rights that people should, you know, should have. It can't be taken away. And in all of this debate that's happened, for instance, in India, the debate that's happened over the past, say, about seven, eight years, when they wanted technology to be able to take over the right to privacy, when they wanted technology to be, be facilitating surveillance, mass surveillance, where they wanted technology to be intervening in welfare, even without testing it, by the way. Uh, the decision was made about, for instance, the people who, uh, who want welfare and support of the state, that they should not have the right to privacy because they want the right to food. It's okay if they don't have the right to privacy. Who decides this to someone else? And my thing is that, you know, it's a very different thing to tell people who have to give up some of what they have and very different to tell people who have very little to give up what little they have. And that distinction, I think, you know, on trading rights, I think that's a that's the basic way in which uh, I would look at this. It's a great point. The other thing on solidarity, mm -hmm. I just think that uh, there is this, you know, the way at least I think about it, and some of us who talk about it here think about it, a big problem in the world today is othering. You can't have solidarity along with othering. And unless we recognize that human rights is a, is a horizontal application that each of us needs to internalize the idea of human rights and each community needs to do it, I think it's going to be really, really difficult. And if human rights is unable to dislodge all the other you know, isms that, uh, not dislodge to the extent uh, that human rights become fundamental, then you know, we are going to be in a difficult place for a long, long time. Very well put. Um, let's take two questions from the room, and then Salil will give us the questions online. Go ahead. Great. Um, thank you so much for all of your really great interventions, and also IHRB for hosting, and obviously for it as well. This is such a good and important um, discussion, I think, for where we are right now. My name is Paloma Munoz-Quick, and I am uh, Director of Human Rights Standards at BSR. Um, and I think I just wanted to pick up on the issue of, of integration and the need to kind of create I think you were just saying there at the end, sort of horizontal understanding of how human rights is integrated across all of these different movements and spaces. And I think that's something that at least I'm seeing as a significant risk and challenge for human rights as well, right? Um, at least in the work that we're doing with companies right now, we see how emerging regulation, the CSRD, the forthcoming CSDDD, how that's forcing conversations within companies that, you know, between business functions that never spoke before or very rarely. And that's great, right? Um, but not really, really, not, not all the time, certainly not when it comes to CSRD. Very few companies are really recognizing in the corporate, um, in, in this reporting requirement that human rights is key. In essence, it seems more that reporting drives the human rights agenda and not human rights due diligence and impacts in managing those, right? And that's just one example. I think if we go to just transition, another example that we're working quite a bit on right now is, you know, engaging with the climate movement, which is important and necessary, yes, that we often get hit with, well, you know, this is what justice means. What, you know, human rights, you know, that's like, it's such a, it's an individual rights issue, or it's um, it's just negative respect, it's risk mitigation, that's not transformative, right? And so there's a limited understanding in that space as well of what are human rights? What is the business responsibility to respect human rights, but also what are human rights? And I think that gets to just another issue, and I would love to hear your reflections on this, is within the business and human rights community, we have a lot of experts who understand the mechanics of due diligence, but not human rights. 
not international human rights law and the human rights framework. So we'd love to hear any reflections that you may I have on that. that. I love that question, that we're trapped in a, in a, in a trap of our own making. The human rights due diligence trap, and, and human, there's a lot more to human rights. Greg, go ahead. Thanks so much. Uh, Greg Rigonial. I'm currently with Wellspring Philanthropic Fund, although these comments are mine, not the foundation's. Um, great to see you, and thank you, uh, as Paloma said, for organizing this. Um, first, um, I've been in a few human rights spaces in the last few weeks, including the forum where the ongoing slaughter in Gaza was barely mentioned, and I really want to be sure this is not one of them. Um, there is a deep human rights, a deep business implication in uh, the occupation of Palestine for the last 50, uh, last 75 years, actually exactly coincident with when the Universal Declaration was signed. Um, and it's a problem, obviously it's an acute current problem, but it is also a longstanding chronic problem, not unlike climate change. Um, you know, it, we can dive into all the, all the business connections, including not just obviously in Israel and the territories, but in the petro states, including Qatar, that uh, support uh, terrorism in the region. So I, and, and so I don't want this to be a one-sided uh, intervention. And there are ongoing, there's a global stri uh, strike day happening today, including in New York City. So I just wanted to lift that up as something um, that is uh, intently relevant to this discussion, and particularly the, cl the conflict point that Priyanka made. Um, second, um, and I'll try to be quick, it's three quick points. Um, you know, the, there was something said a couple times, and Ian, you said it, and I, I don't want to caricature it, but I want to be sure, I want to push back a little bit on the idea that we all have to lean into our individual human rights responsibilities. I think part of the problem is that, you know, these institutions, governments, companies, et cetera, have so much power that our individual, you know, I, I think about the, the way that the fossil fuel industry uh, weaponized this concept of the carbon footprint, right? We each have to take responsibility for our, for our uh, contributions to climate change, when in fact, what we can each do individually is almost irrelevant uh, in the face of the systemic inducements, the systemic incentives that exist for, uh, for climate change. Um, I, think, I think we have to focus on the collective responses, to your point, Priyanka, about solidarity, um, and, and, and you know, obviously we can act collectively in solidarity to, to act at the systems level, but when we look too much to the, to the individual responsibilities, I think we, can, we risk losing sight of that. Um, I think one of the challenges for human rights that I see in that is that it, it has this individual focus, or at least it has historically, right? It, it certainly in the, US, in the uh, Western civil and political uh, orientation, but even to some extent in the, in the ways that economic and social rights have been interpreted. And I think one of the ways that it can ensure its relevance, to your point, Ian, is to draw on some of the traditions uh, for, for protecting human dignity that weren't strictly inscribed into the Universal Declaration, but that did feed into the concepts of economic and social rights, whether those are some of the concepts of protections for human rights that exist mainly in the Latin American context, in the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Commission, um, in other contexts, I, I don't know, um, I don't know all the regions to speak, to speak about all the traditions, but I'm sure that there are other, um, other ideas, certainly in, in African contexts and, and concepts of, of Ubuntu and other uh, collective responses. So I think there's, there, there are directions that we can go in um, that will strengthen human rights over the medium term that are not necessarily existing in the text of uh, the Universal Declaration, but I think will ensure their relevance. Lastly, really quickly, um, I just want to echo what, what uh, Haley said about the importance of ensuring that human rights are present in the, in the climate uh, response, because obviously this is an area that's having just massive investment in it. I just returned a couple months ago from Southern DRC. The scale of cobalt extraction there is absolutely mind-blowing and devastating. And you know, I, I have a lot of our grantees work in, a in, a, in an approach of resistance and protection and consent. That, that horse has left the barn, right? It's not, obviously, some companies are trying to shift cobalt, looking for other sources for those kinds of minerals, but there's a whole global, um, you know, boom happening, obviously, in renewables, in the minerals, in all those pieces that is completely disregarding human rights. And there are really effective responses, and I think the, the question of how we convince, how we are there with our human rights, with our climate colleagues to ensure them that we're not talking about slowing things down, but we are talking, and we are talking about um, ensuring that we don't replicate the patterns of the fossil fuel industry, and that in some cases there's a there's a business case to be made, right? That you will slow things down, but not always. And even so, um, there is uh, the the whole the whole system will lose legitimacy. And I think that goes a bit to the point that you're making, Ian, about sort of the the disintegrating consensus around human rights. Partly is that it it we do risk that it's instrumentalized. To, to Paloma's point.
Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Thanks. Salil, what, what have we heard online? Oh, there are four questions. So do you want to take these first? And we'll take them all. No, take all of you yours want to take everything and together. I'll let okay. the, the panel yeah. choose. Yeah, I'll, I'll paraphrase on. because some are long. Uh, one is a straightforward question about climate from Chris, which is about some conversation about damage and loss and where it, where it stands. Maybe, Haley, you want to tackle that. One from Zofshan Siddiq, which was also asked in the previous panel, but it applies more here, and I'm glad Zofshan has stayed with us and asked it now, the impact of artificial intelligence on human rights. Helen Russell has asked a question that picks on what Greg was just talking about, DRC, and that's about the minerals and the way they are being extracted and, and source and the conflict trigger, and he, she, she mentioned Eastern Kivu, in, in fact. In, and, and the other part is surveillance and satellite-based satellite surveillance and the potential abuse such as the Khashoggi case, as we knew, but there's a lot more than that that surveillance can do. And then there's a broader question from Isabel O'Connell, which is about the Canadian Modern Slavery Act experiencing a pushback from industries and you know to push the de deadlines and reporting requirements further and further and in a way moving away from a system that would have unwanted penalties and preventing criti critical goods from entering Canada and how that can be tackled. So I suppose that goes back again to, in a way, to the Paula's question and the, what, what she had mentioned about the, the instruments that are being done to deal with human rights. Are they completely devoid from that? There's a lot there, friends. Um, give us, in the, in the sort of remaining seven or eight minutes we have, um, answer the ones you, you feel most sort of drawn to, and, and, and also sort of concluding remarks. Um, I mean, I think it's been a mixture of challenging, almost depressing complexity, but also I, I've heard some quite interesting areas of, 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 of potential ways forward here. So, Priyanka, why don't you go first and we'll work our way across. Sure, an easy set of questions. <laughs> Greg, I really wanna thank you for bringing what's happening into in Gaza into this space. It's such an important, um, it's such an important intervention and it does sit quite uncomfortably that as we mark the anniversary of the UDHR, we are also, you know, there's also the, glo the global day, the global strike day, um, which, you know, we are not observing by being here, um, which is very painful. Um, but I, so to, you know, I think we're sitting at this, you know, sort of underlying this conversation has been this uncomfortable tension between sort of despair as we see the international institutions and world order really, you know, not upholding the functions that they're meant to uphold, not being mechanisms for clear enforcement of the international human rights order, <clears throat> not being places where, uh, advocates can effectively turn to for accountability for some of these key mechanisms. Um, you spoke of the Canada's Modern Slavery Act and sort of pushback in the reporting requirements. I mean, I recently re learned that the reporting cycle for the ICCPR, uh, state parties who are you know, answering on their review now have, instead of one year, three years to respond to questions that are posed to them, which seems to render the whole exercise far, far less useful. And I was quite astonished when I found that out. Um, so how can we confront the very real, both sort of field-wide or, you know, global challenges that each of us has touched on in particular and that we've sort of agreed upon that our world is facing the crumbling of, you know, or sort of ineffectiveness of international institutions, the Security Council, the Human Rights Council, in the face of some of the world's most grave human rights abuses. And how can we also find ways of getting back up and, you know, sort of continuing as human rights activists or advocates? And uh, how can we find a path forward? And for me, that's why I reflected upon solidarity. It's not an answer. Um, I certainly don't consider myself an expert in this area. It's a complex concept. It's not a bumper sticker. It's not an emoji. It's not sort of a neat solution. It is a multi-layered sort of source of tools and tactics. Um, but I don't think we're gonna find, I, and I think the reason I've come to it and want to better understand it and look at the history of the labor movement, and, you know, CIW is such an inspiration in this space. Um, 
because I don't really know where else to turn. You know, there, if the power isn't being exercised in the places where it's meant to be exercised, then we have only each other to turn to. And how can we exercise forms of collective strength? How can we join struggles? So the struggles of individual human rights defenders, the struggles of you know, climate justice. Are there ways in which these issues connect? Are there ways we can learn from past struggles and take those tactics forward and through the future? It's not that it's an answer, it's just that's the only source of knowledge and inspiration that I personally have been able to find. Thank you for that. Ian. Uh, if we could have an extra hour, I, I, I could really answer the <laughs> I could really answer because there's some great questions. Just very, very quickly, um, on, on Paloma's point about human rights reporting and legal <coughs> standards, I mean, great question. And you know, in our team, the human rights team at Meta, we think a lot about how we, obviously, how we make sure that we bring our expertise and understanding of human rights standards and reporting to these um, uh, new regulatory processes, the DSA and the CS, uh, Triple D and the CLSD, as you mentioned, but making sure that they are seen as a floor, not a ceiling, right? So that we, as best we can, we work as close as we can with colleagues who are responsible for, the, for those reportings, making sure that we're bringing the UNGPs and the, and the human rights standards too, but at the same time continuing to do the kind of forward-looking, um, human rights due diligence and disclosure that we, we, we feel it's really, really important for our team to do. That's very simplistic, but just to say it's a great question. Um, to Greg's point on Israel Gaza, um, I mean, just to build on a, a couple of the points that, that Priyanka raised, um, obviously hugely, um, hugely critical situation, worrying situation, worrying both for, the, for those on the ground, but also for what it means to and, and, and how it's even exacerbating the fragmentation of, kind of international responses and the role of the UN and so much else. For a platform like ours, obviously, raises huge challenges around protecting the rights of users um, in Hebrew, in Arabic, and, and, and other languages, how we protect the freedom of expression, as well as protect people from incitement to violence and misinformation, so many other challenges. And just to say, and it goes back to the kind of universality point that we were talking about at the beginning, just to note that at the same time as the, as the uh, situation, the Gaza situation is ongoing and obviously much discussed, there is, according to very thoughtful and well-informed people, an ongoing genocide in Darfur and no one's talking about it. And, 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 and what that means for us all, again, we could spend another you know, hours talking about it. Um, on the issue of individual versus collective response, well, not versus collective responsibility, because they're not in conflict, but sort of how, how one thinks about it. I, I didn't want to suggest, and apologies if I did, that somehow it's our responsibility. I, I wasn't trying to take responsibility away from governments or companies, but simply trying to sort of think about how solidarity and collective response be begin with us as individuals thinking about how we feel we need to engage, whether it's you know, we, working within a government, whether it's working within a company or, or in our roles in, in, in civil society. And I, I may have been a little bit superficial. I, I apologize if I was. Um, and just on AI, just to say, um, because it's a great question, and I, again, I, I could need another hour, but human rights due diligence is at the heart of it. Um, and you know, one of, one of the challenges for all companies who are developing AI and Gen AI is to ensure that human rights due diligence is being carried out. It's being carried out by those who really understand it. And just to draw attention to those who aren't familiar with, with the work, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, it's BTEC project, it's the project to bring human rights norms to tech development, just issued in the last two or three weeks, three very good papers on human rights and Gen AI, and strongly uh, recommend them to all who are, who are watching and listening and here, just as an example of the kind of really important work that can be done to seek to ensure that, um, that companies are, are, are thinking about human rights uh, with AI development. Thank you, Ian. Haley, final words to you, and then Usha. Yeah, I guess a couple of takeaways for me. I mean, one is sort of the instinctual belief that it will cost far more to get the sort of climate transition wrong than it will to invest in getting it right. But I think the human rights community is traditionally not very good 
at that equation and finding ways of really demonstrating the value of investing, not just in due diligence, but in rights fulfillment and the protection of and the prevention of. And so if there are ways of exploring that, in my mind, Paloma, that's far more additive than the forthcoming just transition reporting directive or framework that we know is coming around the pike. And I will rue the day that it comes because I think it will absolutely distract from the the quiet hard work that needs to be happening on the ground, right? Of just this doing this work day to day, not focusing on what needs to go in that annual report. Um, so I suppose that's a, just sort of a, a call to action in the room that if there are new creative ways of finding that leverage, that that sort of argument, that business case, if you will, and I agree the win-win-win can be a little problematic at times, but really getting business to understand the value of actually preventing these impacts from happening and, and sort of strategically aligning their due diligence with, with rights fulfillment. Because I completely agree with the point Usha made that I think too often human rights are treated as a nice to have benefit and oh, isn't it so great that we you know gave you this one scrap, right? And if, you know, the world, if, if the different economic actors at hand actually embrace that you know, human rights is ultimately about agency, and when you embrace that lens, it completely changes the sort of, you know, qualification, the, the quantification, the decision metric ahead of you. Um, it would lead to a very different trajectory, and it would better balance, I think, the sort of um, fact that this transition, if it is to be just at all, is about both process and outcome. And at the moment, I think there's far too much emphasis on the process piece. And it goes back to my earlier point, really, about the tension between pace and progress that I think will perpetuate for the next um, foreseeable period. So I suppose the one other point I wanted to make was one a, a colleague was um, secretly emphasizing to us, uh, John, for us to emphasize, which is a reminder that there's some overlooked articles within the UDHR. One, Article 28 and 29, every was, everyone is entitled to a just social and international order. And 29, everyone has duties to community. Um, a lot of it is there, it just needs to be held up. Good catch, good catch. Usha. Thanks. Uh, I just have, I'm sorely tempted to say this, but I think tech controllers and tech creators just have too much money and they have too much influence. And I think if we need to be able to deal with the kind of problems that technology is creating, we need to be able to deal with these two uh, serious issues. Turn the volume up a little bit. Thank you. And uh, somebody raised a question on uh, AI. And human rights, I think by now we know that a, a, this is the age of AI because, you know, government after government is assisting companies and companies themselves are finding various ways of knowing as much as they can and as intimately about every person. So we become what can be known and we are not the people that we are. That's a huge, huge problem. Also, we know about all, all the biases. We know, uh, you know, we, we know that, uh, for instance, I think one of the companies had, uh, you know, had taken uh, facial recognition technology to the police and they found that there were errors happening. And they said, oh, we can get rid of the error. We just need everybody in the world to get it. Usha, sure, I think we're just losing you now. That's a shame. You're frozen. <laughs> but I think we almost got there. Um, Too many people oh. are talking. Oh, I'm sorry. I just. Yeah. Keep going. Uh, just we can one hear. last word. That I think. I, I don't know if I'm to stop, but I'll just say one word and stop. That uh, this is a time when even those who are in the world of tech are talking about human extinction. I don't know about human extinction per se, but we can clearly see the, uh, you know, the, the enormous diluting and even putting away of human rights. And that's one reason that I think tech and human rights has to be discussed much, much more without offering excuses to companies uh, when they say that they are dealing with, you know, that they are also trying to deal with rules and they try and figure out what to do about things. Uh, there, there does need to be an immediate and urgent intervention in this area if human rights are to survive at all. Great. Well, thank you, Usha. Thank you to the panel. Um, and thank you to those who are in the room here in New York and those of you who've joined online around the world, either watching this live or watching this at a later date. Um, I think 
I won't try and summarize, but, but solidarity, interconnectedness, this idea that we w need to operate more in a systems way, um, perhaps at the start of some things we need to think more about um, as we sort of realign. I think what's clear is that the way we've done business and human rights the past 30 years, certainly since I've been involved, um, which you could call the post-Cold War period and, and, and the work of John Ruggie and then national due diligence requirements, modern slavery acts and everything is important, but it doesn't necessarily equip us for the next period that, that looms ahead. I think the rules of the game are going to be hard power, um, uh, regional uh, divisions, uh, blocks. But I think with that might become you know, the, the solidarity question might sort of appear as, as, as a possibility. Priyanka, it's really interesting that that's the one thing you felt you could take hold of, really. Um, so we think we need to think about that a lot more, what does solidarity across all these divisions really mean. Thank you for, I think, sharing very personal uh, reflections uh, on what is a very, very difficult uh, time. Our solidarity and our thoughts with those around the world who are suffering today in many places, um, including some of those mentioned already. Um, thank you again, and go safely. Uh, you can stay in the building until one o'clock. The coffee and cookies should still be there. Um, do use the time to, to say hello to each other and share your humanity. Thank you very much.